Hello and welcome. This is Gideon the Half Knowing, and you are listening to episode 22 of Elden Kings and Elden Ring Discussion. Uh, today's episode is something special for Armored Core 6's upcoming release. I have two uh, experts on the older titles of the series uh, Sophie from Sinclair Lore and uh, Aesir Aesthetics from his personal channel to, um, to talk about. How are you guys doing today? Good. Good, 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 good. good. Yeah, so, you know, it's exciting to have uh, two people on that are, like, quote-unquote experts, you know, here to talk to me <laughs> about everything. <laughs> yeah, we were saying before beforehand that, like, Acer and I mostly know the older games, um, because, like, the older ones for me came out when I was a teenager, so I played them in high school, and Acer is, you're kind of playing through them in release order, so you're sort of, like, you've started with the older ones and you're moving into the later ones. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. It's cool that you've been playing them for, like, so long and have, like, a history yeah. with it. This is um actually how I got into From Software in the first place. Ooh, so okay. I didn't realize From Soft made Demon Souls until, like, a bit in. Yeah, I didn't... Because re- I'd, 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 I'd always thought of them as, like, the, the Armored Core people. I think that's true of a lot of people in the West as well, because that was, like, their flagship series here. Because, like, King- Kingsfield never really took off here. Like, it obviously had fans, but it wasn't massive. But, like, um, yeah, I played the first Armored Core a lot as a teenager. It came out when I was, like, 13 or 14. And um, played that a lot in high school. And then um, I moved into the PS2 generation. And then uh, I sort of dropped off around there, like, in terms of consoles. So I didn't really have a PS3 until much, much later in the console's lifespan. So I did play the PS3 ones, but I didn't play them in depth. Hmm. Okay. What's your history look like, Acia? Like, how did you get started with that? So after I finished the Kingsfield and the Shadow Tower videos, I needed some more content. So I, I started <laughs> digging into the From Software <laughs> mines, and I found that they made like twenty nine Armored Core games, and I was like, "Wow, this is the content for years." <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's pretty cool. uh, (laughs) There's definitely a lot of content that they have out there. Like, there's what, like, there's the mainline five games, and then there's a bunch of subtitled games, aren't there? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I think Armored Core 2 has the most, uh, 2 and 3, because 2 and 3 are very similar. I think it's literally the same engine. But, like, 2 and 3 have so many little spin offs, it's ridiculous. I think Um, 2 has, like, 2 has so many. Yeah, 2 is ridiculous. Um, and then, like, five, 4 and 5 both have one spin-off that's basically just, like, another game set in the same universe. Okay. So we had, um, yeah, like, Armored Core 4, and then the one Miyazaki worked on that everyone sort of knows because he worked on it, was the sequel to Armored Core 4, but not Armored Core 5, which was called Armored Core 4 Answer, because it's 4. And then they did a similar thing with 5, where they did 5, and then they did a follow-up to 5 called Verdict Day, with a big V for 5, for Verdict. So, yeah, that was the last one. That was, um, I think, over a decade ago now, Verdict Day. Yeah, I think it's yeah. actually exactly, I may have been just 2013, actually, maybe exactly. It, w- it was 2013, I forget the exact release date, but yeah, 2013 Because it launched with Dark Souls 2 the same year. Mm, mm. Yeah. Miyazaki actually also made the fourth one. He, he directed that. Oh, okay. I just saw it uh, a couple of hours ago, actually, directed by Hidetaka Miyazaki. But I don't feel like, yeah, I don't feel like... Um, that doesn't feel as much like a like a Miyazaki title to me. It's missing. Well, no, it would have been it would have been very early on. Yeah, it, it. I don't think he is really come into his own as a director, and I also think that they haven't really allowed him to just take control of the project. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you can see a lot of like um, Miyazaki names show up in Four and Four Answer. Oh, <laughs> yeah, because it's all yeah. just like Leonard and stuff like that. <laughs> no, but it's also like you see like Ostrava and Patches mm. and like Rita Palash and things like that. There was one. Uh, there was one Mac pilot called Sus, <laughs> and I I saw it on the menu on the loading screen, and I was like, oh, I need to get a I need to get a picture, but I couldn't get a screenshot. <laughs> Missed opportunities, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's also a great one where uh, I I just posted this on Twitter th- yesterday, I think. Um, the Mac is called Stiletto, and the Mac is just like it, like the the image is just like the icon is just this beautiful sort of elegant shoe, like a high heeled stiletto shoe, and the Mac itself just looks like a sneaker. 
<laughs> it's just like a paint <laughs> tread, and the side profile just looks like the side profile of a shoe with a little mech like head and yeah. body poking out. It's quite the design. So, um, you know, speaking of designs, you know, like obviously in Armored Core Six, there's going to be you know more design elements with mech customization. And as you two have played a lot of the older games, I was wondering if you had any ideas about how the mech customization might evolve in the next game, and how it might you know just change in general. Like, what do you think they'll keep, and what do you think they'll leave behind? Oh, um, mm. Sophie, actually, I remember uh, you were very disappointed with. Elden Ring. Now, I remember you talked to me about this extensively because you saw that trailer of Elden Ring, that early release trailer, where he's like offering up the hand and you oh, would yeah, really yeah. hope that you were able to sort of graft your own body to yeah. customize this sort of Cronenbergian monster fantasy yeah. knight. Yeah. Uh, like Very Army Corps. Yeah. <laughs> There's but, a um... PS2 game that lets you do that and I've got that, so that's fine. <laughs> what is it, Armored Core? <laughs> um... I forgot Monster Lab. Monster, Monster Lab. It, no one remembers it. It's like a Frankenstein simulator. <laughs> that sounds like quite the game. You make little Frankenstein monsters out of body parts and they fight each other like Pokemon. Mm. The fan base the... is like me and two other people. <laughs> For the customization in Armored Core 6, I don't think we're going to see any drastic shakeups to how the sort of core configurations work, because a lot of the pieces we've seen in the trailers, these are just like the same legs as yeah. we've seen. Like the, the, the sort of basic building blocks we saw in the first game are the same building blocks I'm toying around with now in the fourth game. Yeah, where it's, it's like, it's the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like they haven't really like, if you sort of zoom out and look at it from like a macro point of view, like... It's always sort of been like there's humanoid legs, there's like hovering legs, there's tank tread legs, and there's sometimes like spider legs. And for the arms and the torso, those yeah. just have weight classes where it's like light. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's like you get more armor the heavier you are, but you maneuver slower. Yeah. The, the changes across the series in terms of like how the builds work, it's more like tweaking little tiny things that have big knock on effects. Mm -hmm. Little energy so, uh, efficiency. Yeah. At this point yeah. Here. Um, things like that, but also, like, Armored Core, I think it's 2 introduces the concept of radiators and heat sinks, which you don't have in yes. the first one, so you suddenly, you have to start managing, like, how much energy each part is, like, how much heat is sort of being produced by each part, and then that has this knock-on effect where, like, if you don't manage that, the mech can overheat, like, during and missions. And if you're, if you're fighting other, uh, other mechs, like the Gatling gun... That is yeah. almost an OP weapon because it just heat like it doesn't do a lot of damage, but it, it heats hits. up the mech that it hits so fast that if they don't have insane cooling systems, they can just overheat and they start dealing basically poison damage. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's also there's such like, like, like straight up flamethrowers in some of them that don't really do damage but just exist to make you hotter, so your mech starts short circuiting because it's too hot. Um, and they also like armored core. Four answered. There's four. Is it with the Kojima particle barriers? Yeah, four. Four also has Kojima. Yeah, four, yeah, yeah. So like that. Int that introduces a system where you, it's called Primal Armor. We've actually seen it in the Armored Core Six trailers, where you sort of get like the Halo regenerating shield. Okay. That you're you're able to tweak that to be like you know how much energy you're putting into this regenerating shield, and then that shield can also function as a weapon. Like you can sort of dissipate it, and it explodes out with like a big barrier. So depending on how you tweak it, like you can make a mech that's like entirely quite weak but entirely reliant on this shield thing, and just have this shield just absorb all of the damage. But you could also like not worry about the shield and just have like a big tank that's just incredibly durable. So there's, like, little things like that. And, like, I think some, some of them will have, like, individual part damage. Some of them will have, like, um, like, um, the thing, the major thing that people talk about with regard to the series, how it evolves, is that 1, 2, and 3, those mainline games, you're essentially controlling a tank, even if it's got legs. Like, you're basic, it's a big, heavy thing. It controls, like, a tank. It's like, dunk, dunk, dunk. They will have, like, boosters and rockets and stuff on them, but they're used to go in a straight line very fast. Like, they're not, and they use, like, short hops and, like, dashes forward. What happens in 4 and 4 answer is it gets very fast, and it's almost more like you're controlling a fighter jet. They move, like actually, the... because the control scheme of the PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2 games, it's the same control scheme for Kingsfield, and it is just first-person tank control sort of refitted to this third-person shooter now. So it's like tank controls, but you still can move the camera and stuff, and it's just really sort of rigid. 
for the third, uh, for the fourth generation. So when we get to the seventh generation of consoles, we finally integrate analog controls. So you can just use the joysticks to move them around. So things become a lot snappier and a lot faster. Yeah, and if you look at like the the fights between the mechs and like one, two, and three, it's like two sort of they're standing opposite each other, firing all these like cannons into each other. If you look at a fight in four or five, it's it's almost like they're jousting, like they sort of like dash at each other, and there'll be like a second where they're crossing paths and then they will just keep going because they're going so quickly and that also again has this knock-on effect where like because the game is now emphasizing speed and emphasizing like your ability to dodge like, you know, it's a quick dodge kind of, it's kind of like bloodborne um yeah so it's a difference in speed basically between dark souls and bloodborne it's like that and then you start adding like you know dodges and regenerating shields and stuff um that tips the balance a little more in favor of like having a light agile mech versus having a big sort of tanky thing so like little even though the core concept of mech building doesn't really change like little tweaks like that have these big effects yeah, and they also introduced this wonderful new mechanic of uh, FPR memory, I think it's called, where after you finish a chapter, so like missions are like you have six missions in this chapter, four in this and whatever. When you finish a chapter, you get a bunch of new Mac parts that unlock and you get a certain fixed amount of FPR memory. And you can take those memory, uh, memory unlocks that you get and you can put them into specific slots to turbocharge certain components of the Mac so that you can actually like improve the stability of these boosters and armor core it's like you don't need to to interact with the hyper specific like stacked excel sheet management of building a mac you can automate almost all of those sort of tiny little things but if you do like oh it's just like that part yeah. these parts of the games get so deep and you can spend like 10 hours just looking at the configuration screen and being like i want to add a bit of stability here and i want to add like you can actually add tiny little pieces on just your shoulder and on like your waist or whatever just to increase the weight of the mech so that the center of gravity on your mech isn't completely skewed over here because like on your on your right because you have a gigantic cannon there and you're using light weapons on the other side so it's like it's it's insane just how like yeah this is why i don't stream them <laughs> yeah because I, i'm trying to get across to people like if i stream this thing live about three quarters of it will literally be me on a menu like fine-tuning a bunch of numbers <laughs> That's very yeah, funny I'm... to hear. It's like a spreadsheet game, you know, yeah, at that I'm, point. I, mean, I used to make spreadsheets, like when I played it, to organize everything. Yeah. That, yeah, that's a wonderful depth to, like, what you can achieve in it. Totally. It's a lot, yeah. it's actually, like, the. I feel it's kind of like the Japanese equivalent of the old, uh, of the old Rainbow Six games, if you ever played the first three, I think, um, where you're just, like, you have to you play as this like this SWAT team basically, and you have to infiltrate these places and kill all the terrorists or whatever. But for the first like thirty minutes, you just have the blueprints of the area and like the possible locations of some enemies, and you have to just like plan out how you want the team to navigate through it. And then you're the only one who has like free movement. And then you can like in the third by the third game, you can actually just plot out exactly where they go, and you can plot out how they should turn when they're walking in the best sort of try to configure how they should navigate the best way through this. Armored Core is a lot like that, where yeah. you can get so much out of the game if you're willing to uh, put a lot into it. I don't know... Uh, I'm sorry, Zobie. Uh, I'm, I don't know how much of the... Like, I want that to come back for Armored Core 6. I, I get the feeling that you're not going to have to interact with that stuff uh, to beat Armored Core 6, but I do think that depth will be there for those that do want to interact with it. Yeah, I guess the major thing that we took away from the sixth trailer is, like, it looked a lot more melee-driven. Like, you yes. had, like, sort of harpoons and, like, swords and stuff. Like, it's always had melee, but it's never been as fluid as it looks in six. Like, there was... It's the director of Sekiro. Yeah. Which I think is is a big part of why... It, and, like, literally, like, in the... In the reveal for six, they use this like grenade pack, and it's the exact same animation as the firecrackers in Sekiro. <laughs> and there was one I don't remember exactly. There was a weapon that looked like it was like piercing, like a like a chain or a harpoon or something. I'm like, that's so Sekiro. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that looks like a prosthetic. Yeah, yeah. And I do really like that because, um, you know, people when Miyazaki, you know, Miyazaki before he was the you know the gold, the master Miyazaki, the greatest game director of all time. 
he started his career as the guy who ruined Armored Core. That yes. was his like legacy. People hated the guy because uh, Armored Core Four was such a big departure from what came before. But it kind of it's a departure that needed to happen because you couldn't really add anything more to the framework they established in the first game and perfect it basically in the third game and in Silent Line, which is the expansion to the third game. You couldn't really build on top of that any further because to really start utilizing the power of the new machines, you had to just create much more interesting environments. And to, to really get something out of those environments, you need better ability to navigate them. So the tank control moveset, that doesn't really work anymore. You need snappy analog to control. So it's like, you know, just the, the natural evolution of the license required that they basically go back to square one and reconfigure how these games play. And like Sophie said, you know, the first games are, you're, you play as a tank, that can fly, and it's very slow and methodical. Then in the fourth game, it becomes super zippy, basically jets doing lancing, doing uh, jousting. And now in the sixth game, I do really like the idea that this is actually more about physically confronting other yeah. mechs with uh, melee. Yeah. Absolutely. I guess the other thing we should point out is, like, um, in, in like, one, two, three, like, prior to the, the zippiness... Um, the series was, it was, a lot of it took place either indoors or in like an area that was like, yes. it was open, but it wasn't very big. Like it would, it would do the thing like you'd be in a forest or a desert or something, but you'd have a little perimeter. And it's like, if you leave the perimeter, you fail the mission, basically. Um, whereas like, so what they do in, in four and five is suddenly it's mostly outdoors. Yeah. Like there's like all these like big, like sort of deserts, big, like ruined cities and things that you're zipping around because you're going so quickly. Actually, one of one of the ways you can cheese the opponents in the arena in two is to just hang around the other side of the arena, and they will sometimes try to boost toward you, and they'll overshoot, and they'll go outside the arena, and you win by default. It's very cheeky, yeah, very underhanded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's actually yeah. it is really fun uh, because they play so differently. When you can get the old armored course, because you can add your boosters and you can move fast, it's just not very intuitive. When you when you sort of learn the intricacies of old armored core and you're playing it as like a zippy mech game instead, that's really fun. Yeah. And likewise, when you take armored core four, I found a lot of my fun was just you know, uh, like uh, there was this mission where you have to collapse the headquarters of this uh, of one of the I think it's like Wraith, the Raytheon or like Ray Leonard or whatever it's called. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, very, very overt, uh, <laughs> you know, messaging. Well, yeah. Yeah, for, for reference, like, the, the sort of evil cyberpunk mega corporations in Armored Core 4 and 4 Answer, they're just direct parodies of, like, existing ones that I don't think you can get away with if, the, if it were, like, a bigger, more popular game. <laughs> so there's, like, uh, this is just Raytheon, this is just, like, oh. Yeah, like, this is Lockheed Martin. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, but, like, the I because there's so many mechs there and you keep having to shoot a bunch of cables to collect the building. The first three try, times I tried it, I was trying to really zip and navigate around the building to outmaneuver the enemies, and I kept getting destroyed. And I realized, you know, I could just fly on top of the building, and I could just like be a sniper and just slowly destroy the building, and nobody was able to stop me. And it's yeah. like. It's really fun to play the fast armored course as a slow tank, and the slow armored course as a fast jet. It's really cool. That's what I uh, I was that in Verdict Day. I made a tank, and it you can have little little sort of autonomous drones in Verdict Day. So I made a big sniper tank, and I just spawned these little drones next to me, and just sat there and sniped everything. And every time anyone <laughs> came up to me, my drones would shoot them. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, I like I like that you can have that sort of maneuverability in Armored Core Four that sort of expands yeah. your options. And yeah. you know, you mentioned how you could fly on top of the building and use the verticality to like an unknown advantage in the game. And mm -hmm. I like you know after seeing some of the Armored Core Six trailer, I feel like that's definitely something they're trying to play yeah. into. You know, we all saw like yeah. the giant open level. You know, far expanding on like what we see in previous titles. We see like. The, uh, the expanded flying mechanics, it seems like you can go up a lot farther than the previous mm. games, even with like lower energy expenditure. So yeah. I'm interested in how you two think that that will act as like, you know, yet another evolution in the game and how you can like approach it, how you can strategize, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, Something I really loved about the fourth game uh, was that even though Miyazaki is not like a really established director and 
he hasn't really just hijacked the corporation at that point. <laughs> um, <laughs> you really get a sense for his ability to direct, to, to direct in, uh, combat scenarios. Mm. There was one mission, and this is like an amazingly simplistic idea that it, I'd never seen it before, and it's just one of the greatest missions I've ever had in any of these Armored Core games, where you're sent out there, and they warn you in the mission bio, and they're like, look, it's, it's night, it's very dark, you're not going to be able to see anything. So what we're going to do is we're going to shoot flares into the battle arena to light things up, and that's when you need to strike. So just like, the, the mission is just you position yourself, and you have like a radar, and you have a general idea of where the enemies are, then they light up the area, and you just shoot as many of them as you can, and then you sort of disappear, and it gets dark again. And it's just like, oh my god, this is the guy who made Demon Souls. It's so amazing. Yeah, yeah something that we've uh, talked about a few times is like, there is a lot of Armored Core in Demon Souls, which is maybe something you wouldn't expect. Um, in terms of like you were saying, like those those combat scenarios, because um, God, this is we're going back into something we were literally talking about yesterday. <laughs> we were talking to Internet Pit Stop about this, but like Armored Core Four Answer, that's the arms fort one. So it does this thing where like there have always been like really big mechs in Armored Core. But they've tend they literally they're just what I described. It's a mech that's really big. Like they they haven't it's had just particularly a giant, slowly moving fortress, basically. Um, yeah, like they're not particularly like designed encounters. It's just what if mech but big. Yeah. Like yeah. there's a there's a, a, a one I always remember in the first one where they, they try to like intimidate you with this massive mech, but it's like yeah. you can just sit in a cave and shoot it in the toe. You yeah, can't do anything. <laughs> Like, it's just there. And, like, there's a couple in, like, three that are, like, sort of ancient technology sort of things that, like, they'll hover around and, like, split into pieces and stuff. But what they do in Four Answer is they add these things called the Arms Forts, which are, like, giant mech, but also it has a whole lot of unique mechanics, right? Like, the whole level is take out the Arms Fort. Mm. So that's when you start they start adding like unique mechanics to those encounters it's not just shoot the thing it's like there's one where um it's it's essentially the radan fight from elden ring where you have to like sh rocket forward as this thing is firing these cannons at you and then get up close to it and then it sort of enters a second phase or like there's one where um it's like a train and you have to start at the back carriage and blast your way through like you have to get to the one end of the train get inside the train then go to the front of the train and like disconnect it and there's one that like you have to um it's invulnerable to damage but if you like are able to stop it you can get under the sort of skirting of it and attack it from underneath like they have mechanics like that and you can see that in the um the arch demons from demon souls where it's like each one of these things it's not just like fighting a dude it's like they all have something to them that's specific like you have to knock them over first or you know like in storm king you have that the ranged um the storm ruler sword that like will will hit it in the sky or you have like old hero who's blind but who can hear really well yeah or like the dragon where you have to like use these stationary sort mm. of harpoons to take it phalanx out phalanx is just like this course around well, the fa phalanx you could literally reskin phalanx as an armored core boss and no one would notice because yeah. it's literally just like a blob with all these little drones around it i actually pitched that uh for armored core 6 uh this was in our elden ring bingo that the best boss in Armored Core 6 is going to be... Because the best bosses in Demon Souls and in subsequent sort of from uh, Souls games, the best bosses are the mech bosses that they've just sort of redressed as fantasy bosses. And I pitched that they should do the same thing in reverse for Armored Core 6, where they take fantasy bosses and redress them as mech fights. And my one was you just have a gigantic jet that's a dragon and yeah. it just flies around spewing fire. Um, and then it has to periodically land to refuel, like the, yeah. how the dragon fights in these yeah. games always go. And it's like, I love that idea, even though it's my idea, but I love my idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds very fun. And it's like, when you talk about those mech fights that like are really defined by like a like precise identity and how you overtake and like, you know, beat them, it's sort of interesting to, you know, obviously you can apply that to like a lot of how they give personality to bosses, especially demon mm. souls. Um, yeah. 
I feel like we see a little bit of that in the trailer from how like there's this one scene where you see like a li- like the player Max skirting around like the legs of this giant sort of robot walking through I think like a desert biome. Yeah. And then more especially in like that boss fight that was teased where it looks like a giant sort of like industry mech in a factory that's just like plowing towards the player like a steamroller which really emphasizes yeah. the uh the dodge ability you know like the assault dash i think it's called or whatever yeah, yeah but then also it's like it emphasizes the whole idea of a boss that is more defined than just being dangerous gameplay wise and like how you you know avoid it how you take it down how you approach yeah. it which is interesting to hear the similarities <laughs> yeah and this is really interesting because miyazaki is the biggest fan so the greatest game designer of all time is fumito ueda who made mm-hmm. eco shadow of the colossus and the last guardian uh Dude has three of the greatest games of all time. He doesn't miss. And in Shadow of the Colossus, he described the Colossi bosses there as inverted Zelda dungeons, where in Zelda, you are in a room and you have to find a key to get into another room and you have to find another key to get into another room. And you have to like do these things to advance. And the Colossi work the exact same, where you need to utilize their animations by tricking them into behaviors like such that you can expose them or that you can... like. There's the third one, uh, Phalex or whatever he's called. He like swings his sword down and then you have to run away and then his sword is stuck in the ground and you have to run up his sword, up his arm and then you can go to his head and stab him. And it's like, it's the same basic philosophy as a Zelda dungeon, but instead of uh, finding keys, you're cheating out and you're like baiting out these attack animations. And this is something that, um, you know, because Miyazaki is such a big Ueda fan, uh, he specifically cites Eco as the game he's as the game that took him out of. Um, I think he worked for Origin doing system management. Yeah, he worked for Origin. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or yeah, Oracle. Um, and he, yeah, that's that's the game. He played Eco from one of his friends and um, and uh, and knew that he had to be a game designer. Took a massive pay cut and he became a scripter on Armored Core. I think it was Silent Line, um, or maybe it was another age. I think it was Alan Line. Anyways, it's like that sensibility to the boss fights, I think, has really disappeared from the Souls games, uh, much to their detriment, I think. And I really, really want to see them uh, double down on that for Armored Core 6. Okay. So you asked about um, us, our ability to fly seemingly in the trailer to much bigger heights. Um, I do kind of worry that the levels are going to become really, really big to the detriment of the scenario setups, because I did kind of find in Armored Core 4 that you can, like, you can fly above stuff. You, like, there's a there's an upper limit to which they're like, hey, you're leaving the mission area. Um, I would hope that they have the foresight to, if you're going to just fly over the obstacles, they have the foresight to have, like, there are turrets, there are missiles that are going to come flying at you from all directions if you're that exposed and you're that uh, just... Uh, you're that isolated in the in the sky. Everything's just gonna immediately zoom to you. So you have to kind of utilize the cover on the environments, um, because I really the armored core games are really short. Uh, people like people if you're if you're daunted by playing the armored core games, you can beat any armored core game in like four hours. And um, I I I don't want the game armored core six to kind of boil down to. This is the game where you just fly over everything. Yeah. No, I mean, I can sort of, I can see how that'd be a worry. I'm almost, if I had to get speculative with it, I can almost imagine something similar to Sekiro, where you have lots of paths to take through a very open level, but then half of those paths are combat gated. So like you say, if you fly up, you might get shot by, you know, an overwhelming amount of like AA guns or whatever. So it might try to restrain you to certain paths if you don't want to take the combat challenge while allowing the player, if they're skilled or have the right setup or they're built for that, um, to go through it. And, uh, you know, like when you say fly over it, I almost feel like, you know, it might take Sekiro, again, not to compete comparing to Sekiro, but, you know, Yamamura is the one that's directing this time. But Sekiro has this really interesting design where the level is very wide, but then it narrows itself down into a very, like, uh, like a boss fight, you know, that's very, like, combat checky. And uh, I feel like with Armored Core 6's emphasis on boss fights, it might try doing that, where the level's very open to many approaches, but 
the boss might be more reductive and not reductive, but like might be one of those more combat simulated times, yeah, I yeah, suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I um I would really want that because I think that as, especially after Elden Ring, uh, a game I love and Sophie hates, um, <laughs> Sin hates. You think it. Sin um, hates it? <laughs> Sin doesn't even hate it. She's just like, oh god, I don't want to play this anymore. <laughs> Sin likes Bloodborne. She doesn't like fantasy. I would really hope that after Elden Ring, we get a really sort of strong return to form for tight and well, uh, well, well structured scenarios. Yeah. 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 I mean, that'd be ideal, you know? Like, I I really appreciate Elden Ring's wideness and the capacity. You know, it, it's like... Like, obviously, like, I think that there's arguments for other games having better narratives or feeling better emotionally. But, like, none of them can quite tackle what Elden Ring does, mythologically speaking. Yeah. And then, like, those overarching themes, which is very impressive. But, personally, I like Sekiro's story more just because oh, it's, same. like, a yeah. tighter emotional yeah. narrative. Yeah. It's very nice in that way. Yeah. yeah. It's, the, it's the only one of these games I truly believe, maybe with the exception of, of Demon Souls and maybe Dark Souls 1, it's the only one, and even Dark Souls 1, it's the only one of these games where I believe that the director sat down with a script and he just did, made a game out of that script. He didn't decide halfway through to be like, wait a minute, I have a better idea. What if we just make a much worse story? <laughs> <laughs> well, Bloodborne. Uh, Bloodborne, I think, had, like, Sobe, you've talked about this. Bloodborne oh, had, like, yeah. themes. Uh, and, but the story changed a lot. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. We, I mean, we're getting off track, but, like, that's the yeah, thing to sorry. me about... No, no, well, that's the thing to me about, like, the Bloodborne versus, like, the other ones is, like, you can tell in Bloodborne they had a series of, of ideas and themes and motifs, and it was rewritten heavily, but it was rewritten because they were exploring different ways to approach those and, like, bringing new things out of it. Yeah. And, like, they didn't all just of... decide yeah. to uh, explore something else. Yeah, they didn't, like... When you talk about Bloodborne being rewritten and, like, um, like literally it was being rewritten, like, weeks before it came out. Like, it was that tight. Um, when you talk about that, it's because they were, like, just sort of tweaking things and moving things around. It wasn't like they just, like, wrote a new story. Yeah. And all the stuff that, like, resonates with us, all the stuff with, like, the pregnancy and, like, the there's child sacrifice and everything, that's so fucking late. Like, that's almost the last thing they add if you look at, like, the timeline of how they did it. And you can see, like, that, yeah, that was, it was always there, and they sort of, like, through these iterations brought it out. Whereas, like, you're saying Sekiro, like, Sekiro seems like it was always, like, that That was the story of Sekiro. And what they changed in Sekiro was just, like, I think they probably did change little bits of it because parts of it are sort of awkwardly written, like, the way that... I think I, the Hirata estate... Hirata, uh, yes. Hirata yeah. was clearly a tutorial level at some point. Yeah, so, um, uh, Gideon, are you okay with maybe a five-minute sort of uh, detour into this? <laughs> yeah, I'm all because for a can... freeform discussion. <laughs> okay, Let's so if it. you play through Hirata, Hirata was clearly designed to be visited twice. Because the first time you go through it, it's really interesting... Um, like, you, you have to jump down a bunch of those grapple points to get to the opening of the level. But assuming you actually started where the bridge is, there are enemies there that teach you just the basics of combat. There are enemies with fire then and arrows that sort of teach you the expanded role of the combat. Then there's climbing tutorials. And the way you sort of go through Hirata, you climb over these walls and then you loop or do a little loop and then you walk backwards and you open up a door. Like open it up, big old door, you open it and you keep sort of you keep opening this level up and it doesn't make any sense because you can just grapple right yeah. over everything. But if you assume that you had gone in there before you had the grapple hand, all of a sudden the level design uh, in Harata, and like Harata is really strong level design that just looks nothing like nothing else in the entirety of Sekiro. It makes so much sense. And then when you go back to uh, Harada and you can zip past everything, now it makes sense that you can go and you can do like where you fight Lady Butterfly and you also fight uh, 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 Owl. Like then you can do this alternate path through Herada where you jump across the pagodas on the cliffs. So like uh, from software, like it's not, it's not, uh, you know, it's, I, I joke that they rewrite their games halfway through and make them much worse. Uh, they have done that a few. It's not that they're worse. It's just like, 
a lot of the times the most interesting stuff in older builds like um in Dark Souls 3 you you're walking up to fight Lothric and Lorien and you look on the horizon and the sun itself has like been eclipsed and that's like really that's deep symbolism and imagery for this series because first of all the sun being eclipsed by the dark like age of fire age of dark but it's also like it looks like like uh it looks like the dark sign of humanity yeah. imposed on the sky and you're like what does this mean? What is the ramification of this? Oh, nothing. There's no. It doesn't mean anything. You link the fire, and it's Dark Souls Four. Yeah, it's like just you know, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't amount to anything. Dark Souls Two is very similar, where you have like uh, the Dark Lurker, who like in one of his battle phases, he just extends his hands outward and he summons a giant dark sign in the sky, and you're like, what does this mean? What does this mean? And it, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Not that we know of. <laughs> the other thing about <laughs> the other thing about Herada as well, this is the thing that stood out to me as well as the level design, is that it ends with you being betrayed by someone and Kuro yeah. is stolen, and then it's like, but then the game has to have an actual tutorial. It's a completely separate story where you're betrayed and Kuro is stolen. Yep. Yeah. And it's like it's really weird that you get the immortality from Kuro in Herada. Yeah. And then you're separated. And then you come back, yeah. And yeah, you get separate, and it's like clearly something was changed around here. But it's it's okay. It's done though in an interesting way. Like they repurpose it because they repurpose it as this like wolf doesn't remember what happened. Mm -hmm. And I think like what's interesting about the Hirata flashback is like Wolf's there. He doesn't know what's happened. He is as clueless as we are. He's like, w why am I here? This doesn't make any. I I rang a bell and I'm in the past. But like the way that it's there and that there's the these people in the houses that will talk to you and they will blame you for everything that happened. And I find that really interesting because it's like Wolf goes back and he doesn't know what's happened, but everyone is blaming him for something terrible that's happened. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. I mean, like the implication though is that it's Al that's like yeah. led the bandits there. Oh, no, no, there, no, that's what I mean. They're... Like it is yeah. Al, but the idea of like Wolf goes back to something, he's not sure what happened, but he's being blamed for something terrible. And it's this real sense of like doubt around what's happened. It's like, it's literally like a bad dream where like you've said or done something terrible. Mm, that's yeah. sort of, yeah. Like I think here they make Hirata work in that, in the same way that like they make a lot of, um, a Bloodborne work by repurposing assets and saying it's happening in the dreams. Because that gives you this leeway to just sort of like directly emotionally just put things together even if it doesn't make physical sense. Yeah. Same with uh, same with uh, the painted world of Ariamis, which is just it was literally made, like this was a map that they, they made and they weren't using it, so they're like, ah, oh, we'll use it here. And then everything that didn't make it to the main game, everything that they created but couldn't fit anywhere, they just threw it in there. And then they just wrote this story about, this is where the unwanted things of the world end up. And it's like, beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Armored Core 6. <laughs> yeah, we strayed a little bit away with talking about how From Software likes to make people <laughs> confront karmic debts in the past or in dreams or in memories and all that. So I, I yeah. don't think we're going to see a lot of this sort of um re like this sort of game of musical chairs in Armored Core Six because the Armored Core games are all mission based. You just yeah. you, you get this mission, then this mission, then this mission. And there's no there's no uh, connective tissue. The best we got is in the first uh, three generations of them. We got like an email screen where like the corporations and the different factions talk to us and they sort of fill in the gaps between what's happening. Um, but it's going to be very hard to try to re rewrite the entire narrative when you have this mission structure. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing that like when you said you can finish my Starmid Core games in about four hours... That's because a playthrough of an Armored Core game will not actually take most of the game into account. It will be like, they have a mission structure and the mission structure will branch. So you'll have like, you do like one mission and then you'll have a choice of three. You'll do one of those. You'll have another choice of like three or four, do one of those. So it'll sort of branch out like that. So um, like you can, you can finish the games very quickly, but like when you go back, if you just make some different decisions, it's a different set of levels. And it's a different ending. I was really surprised when I replayed Armored Core 1 that, you know, the end game that I got in Armored Core 1 was like this thing, and I was like going in there and doing the things, and it's like, okay, this is really cool. And when I replayed it, 
all of a sudden I was flying to like this gigantic spaceship and it's like this laser beam in orbit on the planet and it's like, what is this subplot? Yeah, and there's yeah. so much of that. There's so much like the human plus thing where like you have to really, really dig in deep and piece things together and it's like, oh, these guys are digging up like pre-war technology to try to get advantage in like the corporate wars. It's really interesting. Um, yeah, um, yeah. And, and it really leans into like lore storytelling. And I think that's what I really want to see from soft also sort of uh, improve on because they've become so like they are the lore storytelling company now. It was interesting also in the in the trailer, like they have the guy recognize you and say that you're someone who works for Walter. So it's like this, you know, this is like, this is one of legendary hunter Walter's hounds. Isn't that the line? I think so. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. So that implies like, okay, we are getting maybe something that's a bit more directly narrative driven. Like there's, there's characters in particularly like the PS3 generation ones. Like there's like Magnolia is, and like, um, what's her name? Fiona that are like actual like this is a character in a story but then if you look at one two and three it's like it's a guy you meet maybe twice yeah they do a bit of it in the uh, in the expansions we have like uh, our handler in project phantasma she's like uh, a fan favorite like leos klein he's a really big character leos klein is the hero of the first generation of games now well he's he is maybe the protagonist of number one he's definitely the protagonist of master of arena which is the final game in one's generation and he like he can be the protagonist of all the games or he can just be the protagonist of uh of master of arena he's the main villain of the second game and it's like you know there there are characters that sort of pop up here and there um but there's not a lot of personality until you get to like the fourth generation yeah because, like, literally our handlers in previous games, they're just, like, robots. And they're like, bleep, bleep, bloop, how do you feel about this? You are going to... Uh, there's a great... Uh, there's a great... Um, in the third game, our handler is... Uh, she's actually really nice. Um, her name, Lane Myers, I think her name is. Yeah, Lane Myers, yeah. Yeah, she, she does a wonderful... Like, she's the first sort of really fully formed character. Uh, because whatever choices we make in the corporate wars with like the missions we accept she will agree with us but she'll be like really contemplative of the other options so it's like see sort of our conscience kind of retrofitting our ideas to uh, make sense and kind of explaining what we're doing um but um but uh for the fourth game it's really nice because we have uh, uh our handler she talks to us before the missions and she's like please take care and when we when we finish the missions, she's like, "I'm so happy to see you won. I'm so glad that you're safe." And it's like, "Oh, some actual compassion in this evil, cold mech warfare world." <laughs> well, the, in um in four answer, you can like alienate your handler if you do the wrong thing. Really? Mm. Yeah, yeah. It, there's like the there's like the obviously evil path that you would only take like to see what happens and like if you do that she just is like we're, we're, we're done All right. like you're t- you're too evil she becomes a boss fight in that path right um like at least i think that was on the wiki that like when you go up to one of the cradles and you're doing the evil path yeah you you're doing end up King's fighting path. It. yeah yeah it always reminded me of sekiro almost how emma becomes a villain when you do the yeah. shira ending well you become the villain emma yeah, emma yeah. doesn't become yeah but... well i mean antagonist she opposes yeah. <laughs> you when you become the yeah, villain yeah. <laughs> semantics <laughs> but, sorry, i mean that... I, hadn't, I hadn't said anything for 10 seconds i needed to jump in <laughs> <laughs> but this this is also tying into something else Armored Core does, which is like, um, we talked about this when we did an episode on like the difference in sort of narrative structure. That what Armored Core will do frequently is like you will be a character who people will sort of be buttering up and talking about how good you are. Like you're you're completing all these missions, good job, like you're doing the right thing. But then you'll sort of get too good. Like you'll you'll swing like these like corporate like wars that are going, you'll swing them too far in one direction. <laughs> and when that happens, all the people who were previously praising you will now start setting traps and trying to kill you. Yeah. Like that's that's like that's essentially the plot of Armored Core One. Like it's very overt that like you start 
there's these two corporations that are in they're sort of locked in a stalemate eventually it'll tip over but one will replace like you'll, you'll get another one will spring up and then it'll keep going it's a uh, yeah chrome and murakumo millennium chrome and murakumo and then like one of them depending on your actions will fall and but then they'll be replaced by someone else and yeah. then what happens is like oh you realize that no it's not actually about this like economic system that's holding itself in in sort of stasis it's that it's all being directed from the top down like it's all being controlled all this stuff about there's an AI system. there's an AI system running it yeah there's this is not like a rational system it's not like the idea of okay this is just stable and it's supply and demand and like if there's a hole in the market it'll be full that turns out to be a total lie and it's all being directed from above by uh, like an AI yes okay. and then because you pushed it too far in one direction and you sort of exposed the flaw in the system by having it like tip over the AI starts trying to kill you but it's also the AI that's running the Raven system that like is like your boss so it starts sending you on missions that it thinks will kill you and it's actually really interesting in I think it's master of arena uh, we learn that it, like the the handler we have there and our rival, they both are revealed to also be a part of the AI. Yeah. And it's like, I'm being betrayed by everybody. What is this? Yeah. This, <laughs> this? And this, this is like five years before Metal Gear Solid 2. I feel like that, yeah, yeah. that really gets into like, you know, like from software sort of loves that storytelling method of the main character being this fulcrum that's introduced into ongoing events, you know, ongoing yeah. wars, ongoing periods of stagnation. And through manipulation of that player, you know, in Dark Souls 1, it's like the divine prophecy that's secretly a lie. And in Armored Core, it's like the AI controlling the world. Through manipulation of the player in that sense, they are simultaneously like opposed in achieving their own desires. But then also they are led into yeah. being like the person that can, through their desires, controls what happens to the entire universe. It's like, it's a very cool way of storytelling that I think, you know, like, from software as well where through the personal narrative you have a macro narrative that affects the whole yes. world yeah i think this is really uh the best showing i've seen of this in so far is actually the third game the third game is just a remake of the first game it's a new timeline essentially yeah yeah and it's like the same story but they do a really interesting thing right at the beginning of the game they, they like you get a message from the controller that's the ai and the controller just tells you hey behave yourself in my society. Mm -hmm. And we learn that the controller, this is public knowledge. The controller is a secret in the first game, but it's really open in the first game, uh, in the third game. And all of the factions are sort of, like they have, like for the first time, they all have these deep ideological, philosophical debates within themselves because they're all sort of, they all exist around this idea that the controller is beginning to visibly malfunction. And one of the companies, uh, I think it's Crest or Mirage. Uh, I think it's Crest. Uh, no, it's Mirage. Mirage, they believe that we shouldn't mess with the controller, even though it's uh, like it's going crazy. And uh, Mirage and Crest are like, no, we should we should take over the controller and use it to expand our corporate power. And then you have like Kizaragi who have their ideas. You have Union or like terrorists who just want to destroy it. And it's kind of like Elden Ring before the Elden Ring was shattered, where it's like. It's kind of like just right before the Shattering War, where all of these factions have all of these different ideas about how to replace the existing collapsing order. And then you're put in the seat there, and you're made to finally confront the controller. Uh, do you, are you okay with spoilers? Oh, absolutely. I mean, like, spoiler warning for Armored Core 3 for anyone that does care. <laughs> for this 20-year-old 20, 20 game, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, go for it. So we learn at the end, we learn at the end of Armored Core 3 that the controller was programmed to break down uh, because the hope was that, you know, humanity lives in underground cities in the first game and the third game because uh, nuclear wars destroyed the surface world. But there's a surface reclamation project going on that's kind of being kept secret, and the controller was designed to gradually break down so that um, humanity could learn to sort of take over control of leading their own destinies. And the hope was that after the corporate wars that destroyed the surface world have been eradicated in the subterranean world, humanity now having achieved a state of peace and being able, having been retaught to control their destinies again after the controller breaks down, they'll be able to go back to the surface now that the surface world has been sort of re um 
uh, terraformed and made livable again, they can go to the surface and live a, live into the bright future. Yeah, yeah. But it didn't really work because the corporate wars didn't end. The, it's still just mech warfare. And you don't destroy the controller because you you have a better idea for how to manage it. No, the, the, the ideas the companies and the organizations have are we have to destroy the controller no matter what. Or... We have to leave the controller on no matter what, or we have to just we have to destroy the controller and take it over so we can make a lot of money. It's just like nobody has a nobody has any idea of what to do after the controller is gone, other than just things need to burn. And um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I mean, like it's again very typical from software it, from it, how it sounds, just in the sense that they propose this like dark situation, but they don't propose an ideal way forward. They just give a mishmash of options presented in different like boss philosophies and faction yeah. personalities, which is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I can sort of like I don't know sense a lot of what Armored Core Six is and how you describe Armored Core Three. Not that I know a lot about it because it's not released yet, but like from how it sounds, like there is this you know well you know it's the first it's it's different in the sense that it's the first game that's outside of the solar system you know from how it sounds you know it's on a distant planet yeah but in that sense it yeah. sounds very I mean, dune two, inspired two is oh yeah well, okay so armored core well, 2 is on mars yeah but yeah. that's sort of as far as it goes it's like it's like that level of like space exploration like we can get to mars and that's about it it yeah, stays and, in the solar yeah. system. Yeah, yeah and yeah. and the, it's not Mars because we need to introduce a bunch of wacky new magic sci-fi MacGuffins. It's just it's Mars so that we can be far enough removed from the Earth government that we can recreate that sort of corporate war. Yeah, um, yeah, it's sort of it's a frontier. Structure. Yeah, yeah, basically, and like the 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 neck that the Earth government has stretching to Mars. Um, like they can't really squeeze the neck to uh, rein the the sort of craziness of Mars in because the corporations did too good of a job and they basically just become autonomous. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that stands out to me about Six being on another planet is the idea of like, firstly, the fact the planet just has this name like Rubicon Five, which is like that implied like just that name sort of implies okay, there's a lot of these other planets out there. Like, it sounds yeah. like something from, like, Star Trek or something like that. It doesn't sound like... Yeah. Um, but specifically, the way that, like, the plot is that they discover something they're called Rubicon Energy that, like, they release and it does something. Like, that, that's, that to me, is the part that sounds most odd, like, most unlike the ones that have come before. Mm. Like, that's, that, that yeah. sounds like, like more like a fantasy story. Like, we unlocked the thing we were never supposed to find and now it has, like, been released. Um, like you would Kojima think... particles. Kojima particles were kind of like that, but yeah, kind of. specifically with Rubicon energy, they they it was originally called Melange. So it's like we you think get a so, real yeah. yeah. So it's from like... the leaks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like okay, so this is this is something more. This is gonna play into like the philosophical ideas of the game. Yeah, as well. yeah. Because Kojima particles are like it's something that exists and it's dangerous and you can use it as a power source. Rubicon energy is like. It's implied to be alien. Like, we've uncovered this, like, alien energy source that is, yeah. like, unstable and, like, it destroyed a planet and, like, set the cities on fire and stuff. Um, it's not something someone made in a lab. No. And I think that's where it sort of gets into the Dune inspiration. Like, yeah. Aesir said how we think that it used to be called Melange during yeah. pre-production based off of the leaks. I think that, like, a strong... like. Um, well, I guess, first of all, if you look at the uh, From Software page, I think they've officially named the Rubicon Energy Coral, uh, yeah. which is sort of ironic given how it's red, although there can be red coral. I just always think of blue coral. <laughs> anyway, um, besides coral lore, how the algae and bacteria decides the color, uh, basically, I think it's very interesting because if we look at the melange analogy, the melange in Dune is something that ev elevated the human race and they could have they could evolve from it, you know, and that's something that from software is obviously obsessed with, you know, like in the previous Armored Core games, humanity is faced with a like problem of decentralized control over themselves and they've previously chosen an AI, but that wasn't perfect. So they had to choose, they had to grow past it, which is what the game's about. And then if you look at Bloodborne or uh, Sekiro, there's like these deep-seated issues in humanity, you know, Bloodborne especially where it's like there's that 
very easily seeable scale between beasthood and, you know, ascension being the kin of the great ones, which I just, I feel like we're definitely going to see that in Armored Core 6. So at the very least, I hope to, just in insofar as the coral can be used for like communications and it's an mm. energy source insofar as it destroyed the planet but then it's also this drug that people are addicted to and it's like what does the drug do for you what does it make you see yeah. what is, what are they tapping mm. into that's different what's it gonna what does it mean you know and if it if this is the only source of the coral on rubicon it really makes sense how they could describe like a galactic or universe-wide humanity that's all what happens to them is based off of what happens on Rubicon 5, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was a ramble, so I, I can no, see how it's a bit hard to grow off of it. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> you, like, you say, that's the first thing you've said in the Sophie and I, mainly I've just been hogging the, the audio mic. You finally get to say something, and it's just like, <laughs> just, then you have to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> The second game, actually, on Mars, they did have some hints to, like, an old Martian civilization yeah. and, like, Martian technology. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I I talked about this. One of the people that comments on our videos is, like, a complete arm and core, like, obsessive and has, like, imported the Japanese books and stuff. <laughs> is it and they, is it Kesadiv? <laughs> no. No, way, way worse than her. Um, and they were saying to me, like, According to the books, it's like Martian technology. It's not alien. It's just the, from the previous time they colonized Mars, they left all that stuff behind. Because oh. there's been the war on Earth. Oh, right, so like right. there was a like we had like the advanced tech like human plus and like the space lasers and everything. Colonized Mars, war on Earth, and now we've gone back to Mars and we're digging up old human stuff. And oh. it just looks alien because it's way more advanced. That's what I. That's what they said. I always assumed it was actually like alien Martians. Yeah. Well, but that apparently, make... yeah. Something I didn't like about the second game was that you know it makes sense now that it's uh, old human technology on Mars. But like, I really wanted because you like the corporations. There are no like you can customize your mech and you can, there's very different builds, but there are no classes. So like Morocco Millennium or um, or uh, like bling 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 technologies or whatever, um, they don't specialize in like we are this company. Like we are the pyromancer company. We love yeah. technology that has to do with heat and fire. And I would really hope that in Armored Core Two, I was waiting to have like mech parts unlock because they talked about how they're studying old uh, old um, Martian technology to create mech parts. I wanted to have like a biological techno technical yeah, armor yeah, and stuff yeah. like that but um, yeah. <laughs> alas it wasn't to be um that's something i think i don't think we're gonna get that i think that would be cool but i don't think we're gonna get that. well what you're sort of touching on there is like an interesting storytelling thing they do in they definitely do it a lot in one and the others i think like it's a bit more overt but in one there is like there is branching mission paths in one but it's hidden Mm -hmm. it's not done by you saying like okay here's your choice if you do this thing this will happen if you do this other thing this will happen it's just keeping track of basically your performance and it's changing the story based on that so like there's all these different corporations like Acer was saying um they will give you missions and literally just i think it's the company you do the most successful missions for that's the one that ultimately wins the, the stalemate mm -hmm. um but there's not a point at which it's like which will you choose? It's just the missions that you choose to do. It's keeping track of that, and it's keeping track of all these little variables, and the, the story is kind of organically moving around here, but you don't notice it because you were never given an on-screen choice to side with anyone. Like, it's literally the mission selection and your performance is the story. So yeah. the Very thing about, like, we... Too. yeah. Yeah, like we mentioned about there being, like, all these different branching paths and missions and things that, like... When you finish the first Armored Core, you sort of get this mode where it's like all the missions are now unlocked, play them in whatever order you want. When that happens, you will see that like there's about twice as many uncompleted missions as there are completed ones, and you just never saw them and you didn't know they existed. Because it'll be like if you side with like you mentioned like when you went into space and there was the space laser. Like that's like, yeah, the space like I didn't get the space laser when I played it the first time. And I had no idea how to do it. I got another climax where you went to the moon. But, like, you, you wouldn't know that, like, there were two different climaxes because that's just what happens in the story. And I wonder if they're going to do that again with, um, 
with Rubicon because the the idea of like you're not given like a prompt on screen like will you take the Chrome path or the Murakumo path? It's just which one actually did better. Does Armored Core Four have a branching narrative? Yeah, I think it does. It, it well, I know like it's got um. It's got chapters, doesn't it? Like, very, like, overt yeah. on screen. Like, I haven't played it for so long. I haven't played it for, like, probably ten years. But, like, that's the one. It's got, like, these on-screen chapters. Mm -hmm. And I think it does. But this is, like, I'm saying, like, I I did, I played the PS3 ones, but I played them, like, ten years ago and only really once. All right. Whereas Armored Cores 1, 2, and 3 and those associated games I played to death. Um, because, basically, I just had no money and I had a PS2. It's really fortunate that you owned all of the um, all the seventh gen Armored Core games because they cost ten dollars like last year when I was looking into them and I was like, okay, I'll buy them uh, just in a couple of months and then I'll own them. And then I looked at it now and they've like rocketed up to eighty dollars and whatever. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's really nice that I was able to get them from you. And uh, I'm What's gonna make also, a, it's... I'm gonna make a nice profit when I sell them on eBay. Oh, it's also fortunate that we're both in PAL <laughs> regions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because you, if one of us been NTSC, you couldn't use them. That's true. That's true. Mm. Yeah. Um, so Yamamura directing the game. Do we want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, obviously that you know, I imagine that there's going to be a lot of focus on the idea of the posture mechanic. From what we see in the gameplay reveal, it looks like you can stun enemies, but there's no repost function. It's just that you sort of wail on them with whatever yeah. weapons you have. So uh, what do you think that that will mean about like combo potential or posture builds? So um, we know, okay, Yamamura directed Sekiro. Um, yeah. I think the official line is that he created the combat system and that Miyazaki is like, Miyazaki is the credited director, but like Miyazaki wrote the script and I think he created like the outline while Yamamura was designing the combat system and then i think miyazaki was like here's this boss here's this boss here's this boss and he like mapped it out and then yamamura did the day-to-day -day of like actually designing the whole game um yeah that's not a knock on miyazaki uh I, I i hate how japan they do this a lot you see this a lot in like team silent 2 and like capcom games often it's like the credited director it's not the person who's directing the project. Oftentimes, it's just like, oh yeah, you know, because I, I, I told like I was this, I was the secretary of the producer, so I'm the director because like I organized these people to meet. But it's like, you know, the creative director of Silent Hill Two is the, uh, I think is the visual designer uh, Takayoshi Sato, but the credited creative director is like a totally different guy, and it's just like you know, they're really bad. I feel like in Japan giving credit uh mm. assigning it to the job that's done rather than the title of the job um but yeah yamamura is very much i feel the director of sekiro and um getting him in for armored core did he do any armored core games um who made the fifth one do you remember i wouldn't know no i uh I, I, anyways um i i i really want for Miyazaki, I, I get the feeling Miyazaki is not as involved in this, um, no. because I feel like he was kind of burnt out on doing well, it's, Core. It's, it's that, and also like he's the president of the company now, so he's not yeah. doing... That's our theory about Yui Tanamura. Yeah, Tanamura because made Elden Tanam Ring. <laughs> Tan no, but Tanamura has been there like a really fucking long time. Like He, yeah. he directed Armored, Armored Core 2 spinoffs. Like, he's been there that long. And... Our theory is, like, he probably didn't want to be promoted because he liked doing game design. Because yeah. you'd expect if someone's <laughs> going to be promoted up in the company, it's Yui who seems to be doing fucking everything for them, like... Yeah, and he's, like, he was Natoshi Jin's, like, second-hand guy for years. Yeah, yeah, and they're just, like, throwing him, like, this project doesn't work, fix it, Yui, but he's never, he's not the president, Miyazaki's the president. And I just get the impression he maybe doesn't sort of want to be kicked upstairs and work in, like, management. He wants to keep just sitting there designing levels and stuff. Yeah, and um, what was his name? Who um, The guy who left Arm uh, from software after Miyazaki became president. And he made he made his own... I think he made a mech game that wasn't super well-received. Um, oh, the may have... guy... Day Demon X Machina. Is that one? It may, may, yeah, it may, I know there were some XAC people on Demon X Machina. Yeah, there there was there was some big higher up in FromSoft who left 
very sure, sh- like around the time Miyazaki became president. And I was talking to Casey about this. Uh, and Diana had this idea that, or, or like, you know, it's very obvious, it's kind of that, yeah, this guy felt like he kind of deserved the promotion because he'd been there forever and they chose Miyazaki, which is like, you know, it's kind of fair in one way because like Miyazaki, he had, what, two successful games under his belt yeah. by the time they made him president, but they were like super successful games. He put FromSoft really on the map from where they were originally. I would really like for Miyazaki to be put back into like just i'm a game director don't make him i i really don't love that he's the president now because um i i love his game design so much and we're not getting a lot of that anymore um uh but yeah anyways um and and like yui tanamura i mean what a hero brought in like the last minute hey yeah dark souls 2 it's a mess can you can you can we can you like can you take this complete sack of trash that we have and kind of rom hack a game out of it, and he's like, hmm. I, "I can try," and it's like it's a miracle, and that thing is even playable. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> and like because like when you think about things that were made under the conditions Dark Souls Two were made under, it's like Sonic Two Thousand Six was made under those conditions. It's like that. Yeah, 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 and and he was working with like the engine that they were using. It's like a modified version of the Dark Souls engine, but they're like adding in a new animation. Um, animation software and it's just like how do you make a game out of this uh and it's like in really interesting ideas with how to take the license to a next place it's like he's doing all these contemplations on like the nature of life so like you go to aldia's keep and it's like all these experimentations and there's like characters whose like hats and bodies have been separated and they're like two different entities and you have like spirits living in th- memories and being separated from their bodies and such it's really interesting sort of meditations which dark souls 3 then really back paddles on they don't do that stuff again um, well that's the that's the thing about three is like people initially didn't like two because they're like basically it's different to one like they were expecting it to work exactly like one and when it didn't they assumed that they had tried to do one again and failed mm-hmm but what it's actually doing is just something completely different to one. And then the thing about three is like, on a technical level, it's like perfectly sound. Like there's nothing like wrong with it on that level, but it's not doing anything new. It's just doing Dark Souls 1 again, but faster. Yeah, Aldrich, Aldrich. I think Aldrich is like the biggest departure because it's like, they do kind of meditate on the idea of, well, what if you just don't make the choice? What yeah. if you just really wait it out and things just like rot and stagnate for a lot? Yeah. But, like, um, the thing the thing about the From games is, like, their PS1 games all use the same engine. Like, literally. Like, Kingsfield, Armored Core, Echo Knight, Shadow Tower, those are all the same engine. But it is four completely different styles, like, visually and, like, in terms of the setting and everything. And it's three completely different kinds of games. So like they use that engine to make like a dungeon crawler. They use it to make a point and click adventure game, essentially, with a first person um, way of interacting with it. They use it to make another dungeon crawler, but that has a completely different sort of approach to it. It's different. And much it's more, different much more horror oriented. Much more horror oriented, and they use it to make a mech game. So like, I don't really care that like they have technically like, is that criticism where you've made the same game like six times in a row? But like. You've used the same engine and the same basic concept six times in a row, but you have made like vastly different experiences. Yeah. 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 And uh, for Armored Core 6, um, minimizing Miyazaki's involvement, I would, like, I think Miyazaki, like I said, he's an amazing game designer, but it's like how George Lucas is a great movie maker. You don't just give him full creative control over everything. Yamamura is a good game designer too. And I feel like, because we have a lot of Dune references in other uh, recent From games, mm. uh, I wonder if Yamamura is the guy who brought those references in. Um, and if so, I would really love to see just, let's actually let him direct it. Let's let him do all the sort of meta-narrative stuff in this game. Yeah. Um, because I From Software shouldn't be the company where... Miyazaki tells the little bees what to do, and the little bees just try to follow the master Miyazaki. It should, they should have like two or three really good directors um, who can release these great games on like two, three years uh, uh, schedules. 
And from what we've seen of the hiring process, like getting new artists, GFX people, everything in general, I feel like they're definitely aiming for like multiple studios with multiple directors to work on multiple games at once. You know, Yamamura is taking a director role for the first time. I think in an interview, Miyazaki only really worked on pre-production for Armored Core 6. Yeah, that makes so, sense, yeah. You know, very little involvement. So well, he's he probably be... doing like Elden Ring 2 right now. <laughs> yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. You you laugh, but that game made a billion dollars, and yeah. they are going to expand that license. No, well, yeah, obviously, because that was the whole like. To me, um, what Elden Ring always seemed like was that Dark Souls was a bigger hit than they were thinking. But the thing about Dark Souls is like they had sort of written themselves into a corner. Like they designed this world that like at the end of Dark Souls 1, that was sort of the end of the story. And then it's like, well, how do we keep going with this? It gets a little awkward. Whereas with Elden Ring, it always came across as like, let's do that again, but we'll approach it from the beginning as like, this is a franchise, this is a world. Things will happen in the world. Like it has all this history to it, has these different ages to it, but we're not going to do anything that's like final with it. So we can keep mm. making games set in the lands between. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that seems possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, I was actually really disappointed when they shut down Sony Studios. Uh, baffling decision by Sony, but whatever. Um, oh my god, I always forget his name, the producer of Bloodborne. Uh, From didn't nap him. He went to Team Ninja or Ninja Theory, the, the Neo guys. Um, <clears throat> and I think he was like really, he was really important in making uh, Wu Long the the oh, yeah. three dynasty uh yeah. the three kingdoms chinese souls game and it's like oh i really i i think i would have wanted for from to to catch him uh but <clears throat> they didn't well they got george rr martin that's that's true that's pretty that's good true. yeah and uh i've they heard got that him they wanted to get Oh, you go, <laughs> they, you go. <laughs> they they got him to write a bunch of stuff that they aren't going to publish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is this is the fun thing about Elden Ring, which is like, <laughs> there's all this stuff, and it's like, we, we've literally, like, Sinai literally did an episode on this, it came out yesterday, <laughs> but like, in Dark Souls, like, there's all these references to, like, little events and kingdoms and people and stuff, and it's like, this is just here to make a point. Yeah. Like, this event takes place, the exact mechanics of the event don't matter, I'm sure no one thought the mechanics through, I'm sure there isn't, this is not, like, an actual story someone wrote down, it's like, you know, there was a rebellion against the gods, the reason that happened is to show you, the player, that the position of the gods is somewhat tenuous, how do we know, because there was a rebellion against them, who started it, where it happened, when it happened, that's not that important, whereas with Elden Ring, you know for a fact that George R. R. Martin wrote just pages and pages and pages of all this background detail. So when it drops something like there's crystal people from the sky and someone carved them and they're waiting for them to come back, like that character probably is in the notes somewhere. Like there probably is a full story for the crystal people and it's just not in there. But we will see it at some point. Yeah. Do you think we'll get the Elden Ring Bible, uh, Martin wrote? <laughs> Maybe like five or ten years from now, yeah, when from yeah. software is failing and has to get cash. I don't think it's gonna fail. I'm just joking. <laughs> but... I mean, there are very st there are really small company which people don't sort of like because the games yeah. are so massive, but it's mostly done through outsourcing. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So like all those like uh, if you're like one of the people who's into like digging through old versions of the games. The fact that they outsource it's actually very useful because, like, the artists will just, like, hey, the NDA expired and they'll just upload, like, here's some stuff I designed for Dark Souls that didn't make it into the game. Here it is on my, like, art station. <laughs> remember, we, remember when we got Radicon's Boss Arena? And it yeah. was like, he, I, oh, I, I didn't know I was working on Elden Ring. I was just working yeah. on some fantasy game. Yeah. Uh, Gideon, did you know about uh, Kanehurst and Dark Souls 3? Oh lordy. Um, I did not. Have you told me about? I feel like someone might have mentioned to me like Kanehurst. I have no idea. Kanehurst used to be a different level for something. Yeah, That's yeah. All I know. It's literally like <laughs> I found while I was like doing reef because I I write a lot of um the Bloodborne wiki that some um, very very in depth. But like one of the things I found while I was digging is that like oh there's literally the concept art of Kanehurst on this artist's um like art station page, but it's watermarked dark souls 3 and has all these dark souls 3 assets pasted on it and it's like oh okay, okay. kanehurst was in dark souls 3 at some point and you moved it 
and you just like you just like do a bit of a, like a you you lift the transparent page with all the Dark Souls three yeah, assets, yeah. and it's just it's just it's Kanehurst. It's like yeah. whoa. Yeah, and I think like that's probably like it was probably the the Lothric Grand Archives at one point, which is why Kane yeah. has a giant library that's never really explained. Mm. And yeah, you have like um, like the 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 banished knights in Elden Ring, like that design is also from Bloodborne unused. That that's mm. oh really like, yeah, yeah, like the yeah. twin uh, dragon helmet. Yeah, like that, that's an unused Bloodborne boss, and like the. The Nile and O'Neill, the guys with the wooden legs, like that's also an unused Bloodborne thing. Yeah, that's the yeah. uh, Kanehurst, uh, Kanehurst defender, yeah. Kanehurst guardian. Yeah, yeah, we like, know yeah, we have like yeah, yeah, the dragon yeah. and all that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I also I have this crazy theory that I can't substantiate, but I will do a deep dive one day. Um, that what are the hollows in those cages in Dark Souls Three? Do you do you remember what they're I called? I think they're just called cage hollows. Yeah, so it's like, you know, six hollows. And the undead together settlement? Together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have this theory that those enemies at some point belonged in, in uh, the Nightmare of Menses. Yeah. Possibly, yeah, yeah. I mean, they'd be very fitting. I mean, I'm pretty sure the worm faces from Elden Ring were also in Bloodborne at one point. Because they, they look like the statues in Yahogol. You're right. Yes. Mm. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> That's pretty good. Oh my god, Bloodborne and Elden Ring are set in the same universe. Don't oh my god. I mean, hey, don't look at the golden pillars and the arch trees and the hunter's dream. Ooh. <laughs> oh my god, it's the same thing. Same One of my thing. most uh, heartbreaking moments was seeing someone literally did a video that was like, No one's talking about this! And it was that the arch trees look like the pillars in the hunter's dream. Oh. And it literally <laughs> had, like, it, it came out like years after the game and it had millions and millions of views and everyone's like this is amazing and sin and i are just sitting here like <sighs> why do we bother <laughs> did they mention ash lake at least or was it I don't just very remember. bad bones okay oh, <laughs> so this is That's like painful. so important um you know the, from software has a studio style and there are ideas this company really likes to explore like Dark Souls has a lot of, like, Miyazaki brought a lot of ideas about, like, Keigare and stagnation and stuff and all that into these games, but you can find basically everything in Dark Souls is in Shadow Tower. Yeah, or, or Kingsfield, yeah. Or, or, or Kingsfield. It's like... Ceaseless Discharge like, is in Kingsfield 4. <laughs> yeah. Like, literally, that boss is just like a giant demon in lava. You have to beat him, lava lowers, and then you can proceed. This is a Kingsfield 4 boss. And this company likes to explore specific ideas... And they like to explore these ideas within that sort of visual style of symbolism that these ideas represent. So, like, they love the idea of, like, this dreamy landscape with gigantic trees in the distance. We see that in the Ash Lake. We see that in the Elden Ring Boss Arena. We see it in the Hunter's Dream. These are not the same places. These are, they're just looking at the same idea. It's like the Tsukimi, where we have uh, Willem on the Lunarium looking at the moon, and we have Kuro in a moon-viewing tower. And the, the idea is just the moon represents enlightenment. Yeah, you know, that's, that's like a cultural thing. Yeah. And that's the that like yeah, that's a that's a Shinto idea. And it's like they are they are trying to get the idea of enlightenment into your head. They're trying to connect these things to the idea of enlightenment. These are not the same places. It's just like the same idea being explored in two different games. Yeah, but what if yeah. I want views? <laughs> what if I want to push a multiverse theory? What if what if I, I want it. a thumbnail of me going because <laughs> like they're definitely like it's like the centipedes too like the centipedes yeah, yeah. of bloodborne and sakura elden yeah. they're not the same centipede yeah. they no, just it's, represent it's, it's similar a visual ideas. shorthand yeah yeah. yeah 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 and like a bunch of again like the sekiro like takes a lot from kuon which was their their like uh feudal japan survival horror game they did yeah 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 and I hate to, I, I love this discussion, but I feel like we should steer a little bit back. Yeah, I'm mid-26. so sorry. I am so sorry. <laughs> no, no, this is, this is very good. This is exactly where most of my podcasts go. They're very everywhere. But I mean, that's, that's how I am as a person. So I love yeah. every bit of it. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, Armored Core 6, I think that, you know, since we've been talking about story so much, I feel like one thing that's interesting to try and bring up is that, you know, obviously... Uh, six is going to play into that same idea of stagnation you know like 
armored core, like Rubicon 5 sounds like it's been deadlocked in some sort of corpo war since it collapsed so many years ago during the devastation that destroyed it, which was probably onset by a corpo roar in the for first place. So it's like, I don't know, like how, um, as people that have played the other armored core games, how do you think that they'll try to incorporate the, like, from software main characterisms into the main characterism that's already in armored core? If this is even a good line of thought, I'm just spitballing. <laughs> well, I'm, yeah, I'm like, Armored Core's, like, main character is not on screen because they're in a map. So yeah. it's like, you always had that, like, it's just, you don't even have a name, you have a code name. Yeah, like a call sign. Yeah, you have a call sign, and it's like, okay, so you're just a call sign, you could be anyone. You don't really get a bio. I think, like, other, other pilots will get bios. Particularly, like, um, when you get ones that have an arena system, the arena characters will get these little bios listing, like, this person is, like, they're from here or they're this or whatever, but, like... And, like, and like half of them are just, like, jokes. Where it's just, like, yeah. this is... Yeah, this is, this is trippy, and he pilots the psychedelic mech. And yeah. he's, uh, <laughs> is like, his color scheme is just, like, an LSD sort of yeah. color waves, and he fights by just jumping around everywhere, and it's like, yeah, yeah. good one. <laughs> Good one, from. <laughs> they remind me of the um the Dark Souls Two summons. Well, it'll just be some like weirdo with a bizarre name who shows up one time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is especially Dark Kindle Souls Two. Yeah. There's just random dudes showing yeah, up. Yeah. They've got yeah. no For characterization it... outside of their name and habits. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of like that. And like your character is, you're defined by your choices. Yeah. Like, you're not, you don't see yourself, you just make choices in a menu and in the mission. Like, that's what defines you. And, like, people will talk to you. I think that's a lot of how the characterization done, particularly in 4 and 4 Answer. Where, like, you start behaving in a certain way, char characters respond to you doing it. It's mm -hmm. so, like, if you, like, if you go down the really fucked up path in 4 Answer, like, during missions, you will get characters talking about you as if you can't hear them. And they'll be speculating about, like, is this actually a person or is this, like, an AI that's gone rogue? I don't know anymore. And, mm. like, there's... And it gets real... And if you do, like, the really bad ending, they start referring to you as it because they can't process that that's a person. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a very cool way of characterizing yeah. the yeah. player. Yeah. It's, um... Because you're just getting people's different perspectives on you. Yeah. For returning characters, I don't think there's a lot to come. I mean, all the games basically just do a restart. Every number yeah. entry just like, like sometimes they continue the the world be, established by yeah, previous and there'll, ones. There'll be certain like archetypes that come back, like the idea of like there being a sniper mech called Valkyrie shows up, but it's not the yeah. same and Valkyrie. Have, like, it's like we've just you have two big companies and one yeah. small company. Yeah. There are like staples that appear, but like and like. You like Leo's Klein from the second one is like revealed to be the protagonist of the first game, but the character is not there. Like he has his own personality separate to how you played him. It's just they're getting at the idea that the man who who sort of overcame the horrible system all those years ago, yeah, he's back now and he's the bad guy. And he's completely turned around to the idea that we humanity must be shepherded with central control. And if I He's need to destroy the world, yeah, like we need this because I've I've looked at what happened to humanity after I freed you, and it's terrible. So I'm going to destroy Mars, and I'm going to use this firepower that I have to just threaten the planet of Earth to give me full control because you need like humanity cannot allow to be free. Look at the mech warfare that keeps cropping up everywhere. That's the that's the like that's the only reason he's the same character. There's no like ideas really carrying over or like development it's just that it he, this character makes so much more sense if he's the the hero of the first game yeah and, and like the 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 interesting like thing they do with him is that the final mission of the first game is you get sent on a mission that is a trap and there's mines everywhere and yeah. then when you go to meet leo's Klein in two that's exactly the same trick he pulls yep. on you he sends you on a mission you get there and there's mines everywhere and they're the same like design <laughs> yeah and um but like you know patches first showed up in armored core was it mm. four or four answer i think it's four answer yeah i think it's I called think patch so patch the good luck yeah yeah and um but like patches is not going to show up because that's a that's first of all that's a miyasaki character um 
and I don't think he's that involved with this game. Um, but also, I don't think we're going to see any familiar faces. I think they're just going to do the armored core thing of yeah. Here are here are the tropes. Here are the archetypes. Well, like we'll see familiar faces in the form of like familiar parts that will come back. Mm -hmm. Do we know if this game takes place in the continuity of three, four, and five? No, but like even then, like I don't think they've ever cared. Like you get yeah. like it's got like the the barriers are on the mechs. Clearly, that's primal armor. But we know this mm. is happening in, uh, like, this Rubicon, like, Coral Energy stuff. So, it's not going to be the same... Like, they're not going to say it's Kojima Particles again. They're, gonna, they're probably going to say it's it's to do with, like, you know, Coral. Like, it's a Coral barrier or something. And, mm -hmm. and Gideon, uh, the Kojima Particles are named after Hideo Kojima, if you're wondering. <laughs> okay, I think we had that same conversation in our <laughs> Iceberg series, which is very funny. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, I, 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 I kind of remember that now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I mean it's very interesting to me. Uh, one question I have is that, while watching the trailer, I was like, I was wondering how they were going to introduce the main character into the plot. Like, if you're this person that people are recognizing as from before, then it's like, are you someone that went into like cryo sleep early on in the war and then survived and then woke up, similar to how like the tarnished died, came back? Or is it more like, you know, like you're just someone from off planet, like in Demon Souls, where you just, you heard about this conflict, there's a bunch of money, glory, fame involved, so you mm. end up going there to investigate. I imagine like, yeah, what, what, what they're recognizing when they see you is like they recognize that you're one of Walter's. So they mm -hmm. recognize Walter, but like you must have like some call sign or something that associates you with this Walter character. That's what they're recognizing. But like I mm -hmm. think if it's anything like the others, you will probably like they will leave it ambiguous about why you went there. Mm -hmm. I was actually yeah. going to say um, because the Armored Core license has a lot of um, mechanics that they can sort of lean into for giving you a blank slate character. So yeah. like maybe you do have a defined past. But to become a Mac pilot, you have to go through... Maybe Human Plus is mandatory this time around. And you're like, what happens is they sort of make you a cyborg man so that you're actually able to pilot the Mac better. But in the process, they just destroy your memories. Hmm. And then, like, maybe that's like kind of like how in Bloodborne, um, a lot of characters we meet, they used to dream. They used to be able to meet the doll, but they can't anymore. Maybe that's kind of what we're going on here. Well, I mean, your character um, in Bloodborne is amnesiac explicitly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if if they want to do that, like I don't think we're really going to be because the Armored Core games are you're not really playing a character. You're just kind of navigating yeah. this crazy world, um, and there's not like you know because you don't even have a face in any of these games. You just like you you just are in a mech. Um, so I, I don't. I don't think, think you even be... see a human on screen until like three. There's like someone's hands are shown in a cutscene, and that's like the first time a human is on screen in this well, game. Um, in the second game, I think because you there's see, CGI at the beginning. Yeah, you you see like yeah. people like silhouetted against windows sometimes, yeah. and you see like hands touching keyboards, but you don't. I don't think you see faces at all until like. Wait, Imagine if Armored Core 6 releases and there's just like a character creator, you know, <laughs> you get an entire model. <laughs> It's like how the Elder Scrolls games always have character creation, and it doesn't yeah. matter because you're playing the game in first person. <laughs> It'll be interesting if because it's Yamamura who did Sekiro, and like Sekiro is the one that has the most defined like main character. Yeah. Like, yeah, like the imagine if you're a yeah. voiced protagonist, and your character is responding to the handler and Ooh. stuff. Mm. That would be very different. Because like so much of Sekiro is like. Wolf's relationship with Owl. Yeah, it's a very character-driven The way that you're described as, like, you belong to Walter, it's like, is it going to be the same thing? Is there going to be, like, a point oh where you have God. to make these yeah. decisions about your relationship with Walter and stuff like that? But um, Okay, I'm calling it now. Walter is the main... He's going to be revealed to be the villain, and he faked his own death. He faked his own death so that he could go to Rubicon and get all the Rubicon energy. No, but, like, the th literally, it's a From Software game. You are the protege of a weird old man who's a legend. Like, he's obviously the final boss. Like, this yeah. is not it. There's no question about this. He's gonna... It's gonna be German. It's gonna be Alphada. It's, like, It's gonna be Ishin. Yeah. 
What are you talking about? I'm sure Walter has the world and your best interests at heart. Like, no doubt about it. Like, I'm, well, may guy. maybe he will and we'll have to kill him anyway. Yeah, I mean, Gorman, <laughs> Yeah, Gorman we're Gorman the did. villain. <laughs> Do yeah. we know if the game's gonna have multiplayer? Yeah, um, it's gonna, from what I heard, it's single-player missions, but with a multiplayer arena. Okay, that's like five, right? Because, like, yeah, something that, you're not on five in Verdict Day yet, but, like, the thing about Verdict Day that sort of made it not really take off is that they, it's kind of perma-online. Oh. It was this idea that, like, when you start the game, you assign yourself to one of the factions, and then as everyone who's playing it is doing the missions, it's updating in real time, like, which faction is in control of which area. So it's almost, it's weirdly almost like an MMO, where it's all about, like, controlling different parts of the map with the characters, but not enough people played it. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, EVE Online or Tribal Wars, or, yeah. So they ended up needing to, yeah, and the, the missions are designed around there being multiple people playing them. So they ended up having to patch bots in. Uh, oh no. And it's like, it was really kind of hard to find people, even on, like, early on in release, um, at least in the West. And it was like, that's sort of why I think that may even be why they didn't do any more after that for a while, because it did sort of like sputter out. It wasn't, it was fine, but it just like, it's, it's designed for people to be always online, like almost like a live service game. And um, yeah, they were going to double down on the online model of Demon's Souls. Yeah, essentially it is. And then there just weren't enough people playing it, so it just didn't really take off. Yeah. It sounds like a very 2010s oriented yeah. multiplayer decision. Like Mass Effect 3 had the same thing with galactic, galactic yeah. readiness from the online function. They yeah. made an online only um, mech game on Xbox that no one really remembers called Chrome Hounds. That was more like, um, it was like low tech, like little tank things. It was just like an arena sort of. Um, arena fighter with they all had different mechs fighting each other and that again never really took off they the, they did they did online mech fighting on the dreamcast like that's how far back it was <laughs> in frame was grade. frame yeah. grade, frame grade the game that like people kids i wonder if they'll ever mix armored core and dark souls like they did it in like 2001 or something on the dreamcast like it's literally a fantasy mech fighting game it's like escaflone yeah huh is it supposed to be framed the light and they just translated it as I, it's possible yeah. but i think grind sounds cooler <laughs> it sounds like grind it certainly yeah. has more personality yeah yeah we'll be right back after these messages uh this episode was meant to release last month so in lieu of my usual joke adverts based around soulsborne lore I wanted to provide some updates based on what information has become available since recording the episode. The big reveal recently was the multiplayer showcase. Uh, there'll be no PvE cooperation from what we've seen, but we will be getting 1v1 and 3v3 PvP modes to play in. There was no matchmaking displayed in the showcase that was just randomly working. Instead, people were given access to lobbies that they could create or join, but this may not be indicative of the overall release. We have yet to see exactly what we'll get. One of the bigger 1v1s was between Fighting Cowboy and Ouroboro, which was a fun match to watch. Like, they had a couple of YouTubers, not a couple, a decent chunk, um, come on to showcase it so that they could review it later. FromSoft's very good at that kind of advertising. Uh, from what I've read online, a lot of folks are worried that the meta will work out to mindlessly stacking attack and defense so that one can make use of the hard lock-on system while in close range to deal incredibly high damage. However, something to remember is that the possibility of free aiming longer distance weapons or using spacing to greater effect may be more easily achievable with later game weapons. Not to mention the fact that there may simply be counters that will only be discovered after more people get a chance to play. You know, such as being able to maneuver around the slowness of the tank treads. And finally, of course, there is the possibility of balancing patches being released by front software that would adjust the numbers accordingly if the close combat tank god strategy really does end up becoming the meta. While there's not much info about story yet, they probably did a, um, a multiplayer showcase to keep it intentionally vague after all. We did get a glimpse into some of the PvP arenas uh, being used, which were very big and very pretty. So just a lot of impressive stuff to see. And uh, really, that's about it with the updates. So let's get back to the episode. 
Do we want to maybe go over the list here and see what else we can talk about? Yeah. Um. I mean, we've we've mentioned that, like most of the stuff in the beginning. You know, we right. could get into like maybe the solar system and souls influence stuff a bit more okay. if we really yeah. wanted to. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, all right. All I mean, right. is there anything you want to touch on then, and that gets from the list or in your own head? No, no, I'm I'm happy to follow your list. Ah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm not try I'm not showing a lot of confidence, am I? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, so, yeah. no one really knows anything about this game yet, so like, mm -hmm. they refuse to market it. Yeah, I mean, it's like the DLC. They know that we will market it for them. Honestly, yeah. we've literally gotten more out of a single picture of Mikola on a horse than like multiple trailers. <laughs> Six. They fully expected that. Too. Yeah, they know yeah. the influence they yeah. have. Yeah. It's like when uh someone like when tweeted Nintendo... about me doing that. <laughs> it's like when in <laughs> Nintendo dropped Tears of the Kingdom and they like people were like, they're not advertising it, it's gonna flop. It's like brother, the fact that uh, uh, normies like you are demanding trailers, that's that's why it's not gonna flop. You're gonna buy it yeah. anyways. <laughs> no, I remember when, when they did that. They released the single image of Shadow of the Odri, and it was like 7 p.m. here. Yeah. And I'm just like, okay, stream. And I streamed myself talking about the promotional image for like two hours. And then, <laughs> and then um, someone tweet. I saw that like someone actually had tweeted like a still of me doing that with like never change from soft fans. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's perfect. That's good. Okay, uh, so yeah, jumping back into it, um, you know, I was wondering if there were any further ideas. We touched upon it earlier, but um, Rubicon 5 is going to be the first game that's outside of the solar system, which, like, you know, always, like, previous Armored Core games were very, like, they weren't super science fictionly ahead of what we are now, you know, no, it was like were, 2200, 2300, They were very, like, cyber, the first ones, like, very sort of cyberpunk and industrial. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I feel like we're gonna see something that's more sci-fi dystopian, yeah. where we're farther in the future, if we're like on a completely other solar system, different star, different planet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really interested. The... Okay, keep going. <laughs> when we first saw the trailer and we got that uh, mech guy who had like the big backpack, I saw that and I was like, "Oh my god, it's Dark Souls with mechs. This makes so much sense. It's just like." There's going to be, okay, so it's not going to be this, but I was like, it's going to be open world, and everybody's going to be in a mech suit, and you're going to be in this completely destroyed world, and the only way you can live there is to live inside your mech, because Sophie and I, Sophie and I had been pitching this Bloodborne sequel that would be, well, well it was, well, no, you've, you've been, I, I mentioned it once, you've been pitching it, and you've mostly been pitching it to me. To help you come up with ideas for it, <laughs> we've been pitching this sequel together uh, called called Rusty Gear. Uh, that's that's the name I gave it. I want to call it like... Rusted Blood. No, Rusty Gear. Your it's blood better. has iron in it; it can rust. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> but uh, the idea would be that you're just like you're just like this. You're part of this squad of Max, and you're doing like this deep dive and it's a mech game from from software and it's like really cool <laughs> where did but then... came from another studio yeah 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 but then <laughs> you have this sequence when you're fighting like this giant mech with like a container on its back and when you break the container like uh the the corpse of Koss or something like that or a Briadus would would sort of float out of it and it's like oh they took the old ones they took the great ones and they just they just sort of did these biological experiments with them and they made them pilot these mechs because That's they're the so That's the part advanced. of Evangelion. Hey. Yeah, literally. <laughs> hey. Hey now. My, my idea was about using mechs as like a barrier between you and and the like Eldritch Truth as like a, like a suit of armor. And it's about breaking through and penetrating that. Okay, but that's still the, that's still the plot of Evangelion. Yeah, but that's 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 very much stolen from uh, Evangelion. It was My your idea. Is idea. Yeah, yeah, your idea My... is much more original. And then you would have like around the halfway point, the game starts reveals itself to be a Bloodborne sequel, and yeah. all of a sudden you can get like arm upgrades, and it's just like the arms of the amygdala, and you yeah. can get like oh, yeah. uh, you can get like a, a new legs, and it's just like tentacles, and it's just like you're taking these, you're you can get a new head. 
but it's just like this stone statue that you sort of find yeah. somewhere in the world. Um, and that's but this, sound, of... this sounds like like a, a, a gacha game where like you're you're buying random parts in a store. Yeah, it's like fifty dollars to get the amygdala. On. <sighs> if you get fr- look, Acer, so if he... you buy if you buy ten arms, you're guaranteed a legendary. Okay. Oh, so, wow. Sophie is uh, every time I Sophie and I talk about this game. Sophie tries to hide Sophie's inv- you keep <laughs> trying to hide your involvement in this. You were so energized when we originally conceived of this game, and ever since then okay, you're trying to hide okay, more and more away from it. Let's step Anyways. back a little bit. This is because right from did a game called Echo Knight. Yeah. Okay. And Echo Knight is like a period like implied sort of victorian point and click first person yeah it's like point and click it's in the kingsfield engine but it's essentially point you're just going around solving puzzles there's some very light like combat where you're chased by something it's kind of like amnesia um mm-hmm. and it, it's basically what what ends up becoming deracine but they mm-hmm. ended up doing uh it's the third one or the fourth one because it's one of those things like they release them in different orders in different regions but like eventually the end of echo night is like fuck it echo night is in space now so it goes from like like literally it kind of looks like the PS1 remake of Bloodborne at the start. It's like these like weird like mansions and like hallways and things, and then suddenly it's space. And I'm like, mm. oh, if they did a Bloodborne sequel, the only way to do it properly, because they've done everything they can with that setting, is to be like, okay, we're just moving the timeline so far ahead in the future that it's just something else, but it's tying into the same ideas. So I was like, Bloodborne 2 has to be Bloodborne in space, which is also Demon Souls 3. Which is and... also Armored Core Six. The multiverse theory comes back. No, again. no, no. It was it, it was just supposed to be like because they're doing another mech game, and it's like oh, yeah, oh they're okay. doing like it was supposed to be like a spiritual sequel to Armored Core that then reveals itself to be a Bloodborne sequel. Anyways, um, I loved that idea of the trailer where it's like this completely destroyed, desolate world that can only be navigated by mechs, and you're just like finding these parts of these because like that's another thing FromSoft loves to do is. You never fight the bosses in their prime. You always fight them a thousand years after they've just been rotting and being destroyed. And that's a really cool idea for a mech game too, where it's like, yeah, you know, you don't have a really impressive mech. Your mech is assembled from like the rusted scraps and trash that you can find, but so is everybody else. And it's like the mechs that still exist from the golden era, they're like completely rusted to crap and most of their functions don't work anymore. But that's not the game we're going to get, but I thought well, that was... No, cool. I... What interested me about the guy who was picking the stuff up on his back is, like, we know now that the Rubicon system, it's, like, closed off because if the coral energy is, like, contaminated it. So I'm thinking, okay, it's probably... It wouldn't have, like, supply lines set up. So I like the idea of, like, you're having to scavenge parts because no one's bringing anything new. Mm-hmm. Like, that's sort of what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah, I feel yeah. like it's not uncommon to have that sort of sci-fi dystopia where most people are scrounging for parts yeah, and then yeah. you have a couple of like very powerful people, like factions that still retain some of the old world yeah. technology, but even they don't fully understand it. Yeah, like so I'm... Fallout with the Enclave and the Brotherhood yeah. are pretty easy analogs. So I'm wondering if the, the character who's picking this stuff up, if that's like a merchant, that like you're going to be able to like interact with these people to get like parts they've scanned. What are you buying? He'll say. (laughs) You should voice Um, act for it. I did. I I did it in the remake. (laughs) I'll buy it at a high price. Okay, I mean, like, speaking of getting new weapons and armor, though, like, in the older games, you know, you you bought from the shop for Mm -hmm. parts a lot, but did you get any mission? Did you get any, like, mission unlocks? Yeah, there was some... There are some missions where that is... Like, it, it does change across games. Like, in mm-hmm. the first one, there's missions where the reward is the part. Like, you don't get paid, but we'll give you this. And then there's also parts that lie around the missions. Like, you're, like... like Moonlight? Yeah, like, the mo- the Moonlight Sword is in Armored Core 1, and it's found by, like, you go into a temple, and if you blow out the floor in a certain place, you fall, and there's, like, an altar with, like, a, like a lightsaber on it, and you pick it up, and you have the Moonlight. But, um... In, like, like Asa was saying, like, you... In some of the other ones, it like you just hit a branching point in the story. And it's like okay, we've added more parts now. Mm-hmm. And so, like uh, some of them, like you were saying, yeah, you can find. Also, you can find parts. It's not just weapons. I yeah. actually, uh, I got the moonlight in Armored Core Four. I don't know because like I fought some uh, some lady uh, in some really like 
cramped warehouse. Uh, and I was like, this was a fun fight. What a fun fight. And then I'm like scrolling through the mission complete screen and it was like, you have obtained part GH7-0, Moonlight. Oh, <laughs> I got it. One of my favorite moments in Armored Core actually is there's a mission in Armored Core 1 where your goal is they have an experimental new radar in a warehouse and you mm -hmm. have to guard it and stop anyone stealing it. But if you want, you can just turn the mech 180 grab the radar and leave <laughs> and you failed the mission but you got the radar i didn't know about this that's really good <laughs> that is very nice <laughs> okay so i mean skills i guess like speaking of moving through missions and whatnot like we talked about the improved level like like mm. not improved but bigger level design yeah. we have yet to see if it is improved but uh with that comes different i feel like do you expect the missions to stay on the same scale that they were or do you well, think that what, the missions will what be interested me about looking at the levels in six is that like in the earlier ones they tended to be like you were either indoors or you were outdoors there were mm -hmm. some sort of like ones where there would be almost an intermission in the level like you would go through an outdoor area, get to a door, and then you would just get a loading screen, and then the mission would essentially start over. Like, you would actually get, like, all of your, like, health and armor back. And because yeah. there's, there's no function in the game to actually keep track of how many, how much ammo Yeah, yeah, so basically there was some, but it, it was, like, not necessarily, like, a level you were going in and out of. It's basically, like, it's two levels sandwiched together with, like, a door in yeah. the door. Whereas the way that the levels in, in 6 look, it's they almost look like levels from like Metal Gear Solid or something, where it's like these big sort of complex industrial spaces that you go in and out of. So mm -hmm. that's sort of what interests me, that like you'll be seamlessly like, say like outside of a facility and you'll be able to go into it and there'll be stuff inside and you'll be able to go in and out and in and out like that, these big complicated levels. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's really what's interesting. To, it actually made me think a bit of like some of the better levels from Dark Souls 2, like the like if you look at like iron keep and broom tower like it's these big structures but you're not you're going it's not just a maze inside of a building it's like you're having to go out of the building and then go up a floor come back in again or like go out go somewhere else do something come back and it's all one seamless experience i'm a big That's fan of uh, i'm a big fan of the gaslighting here that iron keep is a good level I was okay. thinking. I was thinking about like the way that iron keep has a Kanehurst. All... you could have yeah. said Kanehurst. Mm hmm I mean, I, like, I, base vanilla Iron Keep isn't that bad. It's just Scalar. Well, that's I, sort yeah, of, like, no, I'm, I'm thinking of, like, the way specifically that Iron Keep, like, it has a lot of big flat, like, it has, like, it, it yeah. combines, like, there's lots of little tight corridors, but then there's also, like, big open areas, and there's also a lot of, like, you go through and then you have to go up, like, a really long tower and drop, or go onto the roof and drop down again and stuff like that. Like, it, I know it's, like, maybe not the most fun, but it's, like, a very intricate kind of design. Like, it, like it's like mm -hmm. a playground with all these different places you can go and they all interconnect with each other. And that, like, I, it's a pretty... I know it's not great, like, people don't really like it because it's full of stupid alumni's, but... It's kind of like it, it, it's a very intricate space, and also because it's yeah. kind of it's industrial, which makes me think of Armored Core. But like Broom Tower, especially like the way Broom Tower is like it's the central tower. It's the central tower, but you're not just going up and down inside the tower. Like you have to keep leaving the tower, going somewhere else, then re-entering the tower from a different position. Like that's the interesting thing about that space to me. Yeah, and I feel like uh, Armored Core 6 and it's ex like, if it does use that idea where rather than like going through a level, restarting it and getting all of your health back, I feel like mm -hmm. the uh, the repair kit system, which gives yeah. you a little bit more survivability long term, yeah. would probably play into that. Yeah, because I mean, the mm -hmm. like, one of the things about Armored Core being mission based is like, you didn't really have the ability to like repair or regenerate during it because you just meant to like, it's one shot, like get in, do the thing, get out, and this is how much damage you can take during that. Yeah. I remember in, in f 3, in Armored Core 3, they added the Exceed Orbits, which were these, like, a little, like, laser drone that would stick on your back. And it wasn't that great, but it was the only weapon that could regenerate ammunition in, like, the entire game. So you just ended up relying on the Exceed Orbit every time you ran out of ammo. But okay. yeah, it was so, like, the idea that there would sometimes be like a, like a resupply truck or something like that, but mostly yeah, it was just, it was not like Dark Souls or something. It was like this mission is going to take like three to four minutes, 
and these are the supplies you have for the mission and if you couldn't do it like think about your approach don't you like if you get hit like think about what you did wrong rather than like heal yourself and just try again yeah yeah it's very retry focused yeah um one interesting thing that i think is you know like if this is going to be a from what i heard that you know like we are you know, it's a bigger level, and I heard that there's going to be a checkpoint system in it now. Um, I don't know exactly how those checkpoints will appear. Like, there'll probably be one for the boss fight, given how the stakes of America are so common in Elden Ring, or how Sekiro just yeah. has, like, shrines right outside of boss fights. But I also heard that the loadout would be interchangeable between checkpoints. That sounds good, yeah. So I feel like that makes a much different... Yeah, it's a much different approach where, like... Yeah. Like, it has that retry focus, but it doesn't yeah. make you redo the entire level, just yeah. the section that you're stuck Well, that on. also says to me the levels are going to be longer and more complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Something yeah. That I really liked about Armored Core 4, this is one of the sort of interesting changes, is that you get so much more money so much faster than ever before in any of these games, and... um. You can really, like, you don't lose money by failing a mission. You just have to do the mission again. It kind of results in you having so much money that you can actually afford to just keep cycling out and into different builds. You can just be like, okay, you know what? I really just need to have cannon or, like, bazookas in this mission because that's the best way to deal with this. And uh, if Armored Core 6 is going to let me swap out my loadout mid, uh, mid mission, that would be really interesting um, just because. You know, you go into a mission, you don't 100% know what to expect. The worst part of Armored Core 4 for me was dying and being like, oh, this isn't, uh, like, this is a sniper mission. Or being like, this is, this is I need to uh, equip the, the sword I have because I just need to one-hit all of these little, uh, these little mob enemies. Mm. So yeah, if we have, uh, if we're getting check, sorry, uh, if we're getting checkpoints, like Sobi said, I think that's indicative of yeah. much longer levels. Or possibly just, like, checkpoints before boss fights. To make you not yeah. have to do the level again to get to the boss, yeah. Yeah. Like, Armored Core missions had, like, a t mission timer that were, like, you have 240 seconds to complete this mission. No, no, well, some of them, yeah. yeah. Yeah, some of them. Some were, like, you have 400 seconds or whatever. And it's, like, that's really interesting that this, these games are, like... And you... you I, I don't really find myself running out of time often. No. But it's, like, these games are really quick. Yeah. Well, I mean, th they do interesting things with, like, time limit, sort mm. of... One one has that mission everyone remembers where, like, the base is flooded with this metal-eating gas. Yeah. So, like, you don't have a timer per se, but the whole time you're there, you're basically in a poison state, and your hit points are just gradually decreasing. It's like, that sort of becomes your timer. Like, you have to do it before the mech just, like, melts. And there's other ones that do with, like, heat. There's one I, rem I can't remember if it's two or three, but there's one where, like, you have to descend down to the bottom of this massive shaft... And then when you get to the bottom, that's when they drop the timer on you. So you get oh, to the bottom, uh, and I think it's Is two. it the sunken ship? Yeah, though? the sunken ship, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, no, that's that's three, that's three. Yeah, you get to the bottom, and then it's like, oh, yeah, okay, now now there's now there's a timer, sorry. And you have to, like, get out before the ship, like, depressurizes or something. Yeah, it's also, they send you down there, and they give you the instructions, hey, by the way, there's a bunch of crates. If you could just destroy them on your way, we'll pay you extra for each one you destroy. Yeah. So you just go down there and you destroy them, and then when you uh, capture the final one and the uh, ship begins to sink and you get the timer, also the security system goes online and there's a bunch yeah. of enemies, and you've completely emptied out your arsenal going yeah, for these up extra the lootables. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, the best li it's the best mission. They do that also in, in one, where like you have to go through and there's, it's like a, like a chemical plant. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing, just blow up the vats of chemicals. And you blow them up, and then at the very end of it, it's like, I did the chemicals, and you turn around, and there's just this, like, army facing you, and you've, like, <laughs> wasted all your ammunition blowing up the chemical vats. Uh, yeah. That's what we mean about, like, that's a mission, clearly you're supposed to replay it. Like, you're supposed to realize, oh shit, the first time, and then, like, if you fuck up, go back. Yeah, yeah. And, and like from software loves to use those moments in Dark Souls too. Yeah. Like every time you get shoved off a cliff by a guy that was hiding around the corner, you know, it's very typical. Yeah, but, I feel like. But with the Souls games, um, I think Elden Ring really betrays this. But like Demon Souls, the Dark Souls, even like Dark Souls Two, there is sort of an unspoken bond that if you if you take it slowly and you really sort of parse out your steps, you really take in the environment, you can pretty you can just piece together. Oh there's an ambush waiting for me there. And I know that there's an ambush waiting for me there. 
because if I was ambushing somebody, that's where I would do it. And he's just mm -hmm. like, you take it slowly. You're not gonna be, um, you're not gonna be screwed over. The Armored Core games, they don't mind screwing you. Yeah. They don't mind screwing you because they know that, like, well, at most you've lost, like, I don't know, like, this is, you've wasted two minutes or something. And the other thing about Armored Core is, like, the parts, like, you mentioned you have a lot of money in 4, but, like, in the other ones where you don't have that much money, the parts sell for the price that you bought them for. Yes. And that, so, that's also the case with 4. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, like, if you say, like, oh, shit, I need to respec. It's not a case like, well, I don't have any money because you can just sell the parts you have and they will sell for the amount you bought them for. So you have that much to work with. Except for uh, the first two, like Armored Core 1 and its spin-offs and 2 and its spin-offs. Um, if you screw up missions there... Yeah, you lose money. You can go and... Yeah, you lose money. Yeah. And, but if uh, you've got if a you... functional mech, you can sell the parts for the price yeah. that you bought them for. Yeah, so respecking's not that... It's not like you don't really lock yourself into a bill mm -hmm. in the same way that, like... In Dark Souls, and two, like when two also has the arena that's just like yeah. A money, yeah, yeah, you make so much money. But when you that. when you compare that to like Dark Souls or Bloodborne or something, like once you level up, you, that's the level you spent. You don't get to change it. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Well, I'm not sure if I can think of so many more directions to take this. Have we're we talked really about common. how? Oh yeah, what was that? I was gonna say we're on like two hours. If that's like, I don't know when you wanted to stop. Yeah, I think this is a pretty good episode length. Unless there's something you guys want to talk about, like how it calls itself omnidirectional and how there's a new aerial focus. But, like, you know. Well, the new aerial focus is, like, I would have thought 4 and 5 had the new aerial focus. That's true. Yeah. I feel like yeah. it was the beginning of it, but I'm not yeah. sure if 4 and 5 had like, if, the if verticality tune, that... If you tune a mech in, like, 4 or 5, like, you can essentially just fly constantly. Okay, yeah. And there's like five introduces like a low power mode you can go into called scan mode where like you're not your your energy drain is reduced massively but you can't attack. Mm. And it, it reroutes all the power to like scanners and radars in you and you use it to like map out where you're going. Yeah. So you Does to, like, that reveal flip... enemy yeah. locations? Yeah, as well? yeah, you like it's like having like like uh like the thermal goggles in Metal Gear Solid kind of. Like you can see like stuff on the horizon and yeah. all radar pulses and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it looked yeah. like Armored Core 6 had that in one of their trailers as well, yeah, the scan yeah. function. Yeah. Okay. I love in Armored Core 4 that uh, it's one of the earliest missions when I'm in the city and there's like a giant thing of water there. Uh, I was flying there and then I fell into the water and my, my jack just activated and my boosters activated yeah. and it was like, oh, I can't sink. I don't die here. Oh, yeah. that's amazing. Great. <laughs> just like automatically activated the hovering function. Yeah, Great. well, that, I mean, some Love of the it. there's they they do that in the earlier ones as well, where like some of the legs will hover rather than contact the ground, and if you have a hovering mech, you can go on water. Mm -hmm. So there's missions set like literally in the sea and stuff where you can just pop out and you can actually, if you provided you have hovering legs, you are just a hovercraft, so you can just skirt around the boats and stuff. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're not, you have to jump between them. Yeah, yeah, you have to okay. do a like, jump between like oil drills and ships and what have you yeah yeah well that's a pretty cool function you know very yeah. very like well they really do yeah. think that like that's that's why i got into from software to begin with because there was so much of that stuff in armored core it's like that's why i kept replaying because i kept finding things yeah like um the thing that always struck me when i first played it is like there's different head parts and the different heads have like different kinds of computers in them and they have different kinds of sensors and you might think, like, oh, this is just for show, but, like, there's, like, all these different combinations that actually matter. So, like, if you get a head with, like, a really shitty computer in it, it's actually worse in some missions because it will get scrambled. Like, it doesn't have, like, the same protections the other ones have, so it's easier to screw with. And, like... Yeah. If you're going, like, into underground caves and stuff. Yeah, and there's stuff where, like, some of them, like, they will have uh, an auto map that just maps around you and some will actually remember like the rest of the level for you like there's different kinds of maps the different computers have different voices so like when you're playing it you'll sometimes get like oh, i am a robot but sometimes it's like the sort of um like british lady voice that computers have that's like talking to go you. and find the rectana rectana <laughs> yes uh, that's um, not an ai voice no that's yeah that's a that's a bad I, I need send to play that mission um, but yeah, and then the one that always struck me is it's like, in the third game. It's in the some, third game. Some of them mention um, like different kinds of bio scanners and sensors, and you might think like this is just flavor text, but it actually matters. 
because mm -hmm. there's certain enemies in the game that don't give off a heat signature. And it's literally, it's in like three missions out of like 60 that this matters, but it actually figured out, like, no, you have to have a certain kind of head with that sensor mm -hmm. on it to lock onto them. Otherwise you have to aim manually and just other stuff. Like you would, when you locked onto stuff, you get a little number next to it. And the number actually is the range between you and that thing, which is like, it doesn't sound amazing now, but in like 1998 on a PS1, the notion like I'm actually getting accurate like data readouts when I'm playing this thing, it's like really. Mm -hmm. I think like the thing yeah, about it, yeah, it, it, like ha having that distance data. Like today they do that, and it's like a gimmick. Yeah, yeah or yeah. it's to tell you, it's to tell you like generally like okay, how long do I have to ride my horse to get there? Hmm. But like it in Armored Core, it's actually useful because you have like missiles, and you're like okay. This is far enough away from me that if I shoot a missile at it, it won't just spatter way out because yeah. of the missile trajectory. It can actually make the leap. And even and, like uh, missile trajectories are a thing because some go over the top and some go around the side, and then they they you have like behave initial. There's yeah. like missile speed versus initial speed. Yeah. So it's like you know sometimes maybe you want the missile to fly out slower if you're shooting it at a close by enemy yeah. and stuff. It's that level of like obsession, but also you sort of don't need to do that. Like you can just go, okay, I'm just going to get a machine gun and shoot everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like, you, can customize, you can customize it. the hut. You can be like, I want to yeah. see the enemy's oh God, yeah. signature. Yeah, you can. Like, you can literally have stuff like that on this on this part of your hut. But like the thing that um, interested me learning about the development of Armored Core is like they had wanted to make it for a long time, and initially yes, they were the first game. Yeah, it was the they first were game targeting. They to make. Yeah, they were targeting Japanese PCs, like the PC ninety eight, and. The reason they ended up not doing that is that it wasn't, it couldn't render fast enough for them. Like it was very jerky. They were waiting till the PS1. But like when you think of it from that perspective, it actually makes a lot more sense that like it's that level of, of depth and obsession because it was designed for like obsessive PC people. Like that's who they were thinking of. They were thinking about like, this is an actual mech sim that we are kind of making into an action game you can play on a console rather than like so they're, they're doing that it's not like they looked at like at like assault suits valken or something and were like okay what if this was on ps1 they're looking at like battle not necessarily battle tech but like some really detail oriented thing and being what if this was more action based and i think that's sort of the appeal that armored core has yeah. yeah, it sounds like there's a bit of a crossover with like racing game fans yeah, or yeah, World no, of it's, Tanks. It's really like like rivet countery, like really obsessive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's very cool. And yeah. we are at like two hours, yeah. so I, you know, I think this is a good stopping point. Yeah. Um, thank you both for joining. That oh, was very you. nice. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Uh, anything either of you, you know, like you know, where can people find you? YouTube, social media, like your content. Anything you want to shout out? Acer, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm at uh, YouTube uh, Acer Aesthetics. Also on the Twitters. I'm mm -hmm. also on uh, Sinclair Lore often and mm -hmm. many times. Yeah. <laughs> so V. Uh, I'm on Sinclair Lore pretty much all the time, and that is YouTube.com/sinclairlore, uh, which is S-I-N-C-L-A-I-R-L-O-R-E is one word, and I'm not on any other social media. Okay. Sinclair Lore. Are you named for Armored Core? Don't say that to her, because she'll actually think that, like, oh my god, this is Vision. <laughs> because, it, because, according, because according to her, like, the S in Sinclair Law also stands for Sophie. And she's like, I knew it back then. I just didn't realize. <laughs> like, my old channel, apparently, the, the F in that stands for the Russian F. Which is, like... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean... The Maybe she did now. <laughs> yeah, she was like, because my old channel, because she has this thing called the F series that, where she, she we do these like sort of prestige episodes where we get guests on and discuss stuff in detail, and they're like, what does the F stand for? It's like I don't know, it's just F. <laughs> and then that became like, well, the F in your old channel's name clearly stood for F series, and like you knew back then that one day this would happen. Oh my it god, stands... she predicted. She predicted Silent Hill F. It stands for Je Suis F Series, apparently. <laughs> That's what my old channel stands for. But wasn't it Jerk Sans Frontiers? Yeah, but it's also Je Suis F Series. I just didn't know at the time. 
Oh, it's, it's, it's like in the Doctor Who reboot where she looks back and everything says bad wolf. It's like that. <laughs> and for more riveting content like this, <laughs> youtube.com slash Sinclair lore. <laughs> if you think it'd be better if I was being yelled at by a Russian, uh, youtube.com slash Sinclair lore. If you want to watch, actually, um, the conversation where Sophie really introduced me to Armored Core, uh, that's up on Sinclair lore. Yeah, we have that's... a few... What I've done yeah. recently is I've remade all of our thumbnails and they're color-coded. So if you go through and just look for, like, a sort of camo green thumbnail, there's, like, I think five or six of them. Those are the armor core ones. Okay. You know, that helps with finding it. I yeah. like it. I also, um, I recently did an episode with St. Trina, who's been on this show. Yes, St. Trina is a wonderful guest. She yeah. makes lots of fun content. Go subscribe yeah. to her channel, too. Well, thanks as always for listening in, and thanks again to Aesir and Sophie for joining me in this episode. I'm quite excited to get my hands on Armored Core 6 when it releases, which will be very soon considering the late release of this episode, and I'll definitely be wanting to make a follow-up episode about how the game feels, uh, but there's a pretty big backlog of other episodes to get through first, so we'll see when that uh, comes out. But before that happens, I'd really love to hear everyone else's thoughts on AC6. You know, if you really like expectations before the release or, you know, what you came to realize after the release, you know, just depending on when you watch the episode. Uh, so maybe leave a comment. Wow, generic YouTuber stuff. <laughs> anyway, coming up next will be an episode guest starring Matthew Shesman, who is a very talented artist that makes impressively long form animations for the various Soulsborne games, as well as for other titles. So stay tuned for that. Uh, he'll also be doing an AMA over on the Reddit, which is very cool. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's about it. Thanks as always for watching, and don't you dare go hollow on me.